Okay, I'm assuming this is, yeah, it sounds like it's on. All right, everybody, I want to thank you for being here today for the October 3rd Thursday. Uh, I appreciate everybody taking the opportunity. Uh, we're glad to be able to be back here in person. We want to welcome you back to the research farm for third Thursday, October, our small ruminant focus program here. As most of you know, I'm Dr. Ken Andres. I'm the small ruminant extension specialist with Kentucky State University, uh, teaching research, do a number of other activities as well. We've got the program going on today. Uh, we've got a, a full program for everybody. And we're gonna focus a little bit on marketing as uh, sheep and goat producers. You realize that uh, Tess Cotta was our grader for a long time here at Kentucky for our sheep and goat market. We have a new grader now with KDA. He agreed to come and talk to us about current market trends. Uh, Ms. Emily Clements is gonna to talk today about some of the work that we've been doing with browsing and some other things. I'm gonna give a brief uh, update on research and what we're planning to try to get some input. And if the weather allows, we will go outside and do a little bit on some temporary fencing and some of the process that we're doing related to that getting into some of our browse and how we manage some of our rotational grazing. Because we feel that uh, the more information we have with that and we've, we're finding more and more that grazing management is gonna be critical to low cost production, as well as helping to reduce some of the exposure and issues we see on a regular basis with parasites in our small ruminant production. We can start avoiding some of those parasite issues by keeping the animals moving in a, in a good rotation. Uh, I want to, again, I, I want to welcome you all here today, and I want to thank you all. I want to make sure that you are aware. I uh, believe outside Ms. Shelley Spiegel has some information on the Small Farmers, Small Limited Resource and Minority Farmers Conference, which will be next month. It will again be in person. Uh, she has the information and registration for that. I also want to remind everybody, uh, we, you should have received an email from me or from uh, Ms. Spiegel are from both of us about a upcoming fencing school that we're hosting as uh, part of the Kentucky Forge and Grassland Council. It's going to be on November 11th. I didn't pick the date. So, Bob, don't get mad at me for picking Veterans Day. But uh, that was the date that we, this is a, this fencing school is something we planned for spring of 2020. And because of COVID, it had to be canceled. We couldn't hold it last year either because of COVID. So we're just now getting back into that. There's also some grazing uh, activities coming up. And I recently sent out information on the uh, Kentucky Forest Grassland Council grazing schools that are gonna be coming up. And uh, there are three of them this year. They always have had one in the west and the east. They're gonna have one now in Elizabethtown. So there will be three. And the one in the east will be in Winchester. And the dates slip my mind right now, but I know I sent that around. If you need more information uh, on it, we will get that to you. Again, uh, they're gonna be talking about some different forage managements, forage management practices. Again, we all know that the, the king of livestock in the state of Kentucky grazing livestock is cattle, but the practices that they're gonna be talking about are gonna to apply to small ruminants as well. You just have to think about the differences in stocking rates on those. So it is very useful information and there's gonna be some good information on looking at some of these different management practices, different rotational practices, as well as some alternative forages at these conferences. And we wanna make sure that you have the opportunity that you know about those and when they're coming up. So those are the announcements that I have right now. Uh, I, don't, I haven't been informed of any others that I was supposed to make. I do see uh, Ms. Joni Nelson came in. So I wanna make sure everybody is aware that uh, the Small Farmers Grant Program is open right now. Okay, and uh, So, you know, what, what is eligible for that? Is there, what, what are some of your restrictions?
can't get anything that has, hello, you can't get anything that has um, anything to do with um, like expendables or consumables or inputs or anything like that. So we can't buy your animals, we can't buy your feed or anything like that. Um, but if you need uh, some production related equipment, uh, things uh, to do with handling the feet, we've done that before, we've done those turntables. Um, we've done watering uh, issues uh, for animals as well um, in small ruminants. Kidding pens we've done for small ruminants as well. Um, and then there's other categories as well. There's organic, value added, aquaculture, and we have a new one called agroforestry. So if you're doing the goats through forest areas, we can help um, with some equipment uh, that way as well. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. We haven't had an application for one of those yet. So we could always send it through and see what the committee says. I don't actually get an, I don't get a vote in the committee. The committee makes the decisions. I just try to make the best case for the farmers. And we haven't, um, we may have actually approved one ultrasound in the past, um, I think. Yes. Yes, food, yeah, raising for food, um, not breeding or anything like that. Um, it, it's basically uh, because it, goats and sheep only fit under the food insecure category, um, it would have to be that, unless you're doing agroforestry, um, and then it would still be running them through, you know, forested areas and stuff like that, and it would still need to go into the food system. Yes, it's online. I also have cards with me, and I have a brochure outside um, where you can look at, and it tells you a good bit of information about the different categories. Um, and I also have a video posted um, that you can look at where I go through the application and talk about it as well. So and if, you, if you can't get to that, just email me, and I can get you my card, and I can get you the information for that. Johnny, I appreciate it. I know I kind of put you on the spot there, but I like getting the information out to everybody. And, you know, the, the program is being funded by the, uh, the Ag Board. Uh, so, you know, the goal there is to help producers be able to get some of the things they need. If you are looking at doing meat marketing, I think that, if I remember right, y'all have covered the cost of freezers and some of this type of stuff to hold the product to be able to sell and things like this as well. So just understand that, you know, we, we want to help you be successful as you go down the road uh, with the program area. Uh, I appreciate everybody being here again. I'm going to turn this over uh, to Miss Emily Clements. As some of you know, I've, I've got some other duties, and because of that, I turned the program over to to Emily in order to get things organized, so I'm going to let her take the honor of doing the introductions for our speakers coming up, since she's the one who helped put the program together. All right. Thank you, Dr. Andrews. Good to see you all in person. Um, our first speaker today is Jason Watcher, and um, forgive me for reading from my phone. Um, so Jason, Jason lives in uh, Scott County with his wife and two children. Um, he has a freshman at Georgetown and a son who is in seventh grade. That's pretty exciting. Um, Jason has been with KDA uh, or the Kentucky Department of Agriculture uh, for 10 years and eight and a half was spent in the state vet's office. The last one and a half years with the livestock marketing department as the state sheep and goat grader. So Jason's going to talk to us about uh, marketing and and some basics of of the the end result of what you are producing. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here, Jason. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate it. Thank Kentucky State for having me down today to uh, talk to you all um, about what I do and 
as Dr. Andrew said, um, for the first year I've been known as the new Tess out there, so on the grading part of things, so uh, hopefully now I've kind of come into my own and I'm Jason Watcher now, <laughs> the new grader. So um, again, I've appreciated everybody uh, in attendance today. It's good to, to see all the producers or maybe new producers that are um, looking to get into the goat and sheep industry and uh, with what we're talking about here today, hopefully we can give you some information to uh, proceed and go forward and to, uh, to prosper in the industry. Uh, it's always good to have uh, new people come on. Uh, I kind of told uh, Emily this morning that um, a lot of the information I'll give you up front is going to be uh, opinion based on my own opinion, some from producers' opinions, and it's going to confuse you all to death and where you go forward. So um, with that being said, um, I guess I'd take this mask off. Um, so that being said, I'll uh, start out with, uh, you know, Yes, we're going to have an end result, and I'm going to uh, explain that to you here in just a few minutes, but uh, who all out there are goat producers? Got about three or four goat producers, and what about sheep producers? And that, and people who are looking to get into the sheep or goat industry, and we got some over there. Well, welcome everybody. Hopefully what the information I give you today will lead you in the right direction um, to uh, make those informed decisions, and I will say that... Uh, my daughter, when we uh, started out in goats, we sh she showed goats, and uh, so our herd kind of consists of pets now. Um, she's uh, got out of the sh show ring, and uh, she still breeds a couple of uh, does here and there and sells the offspring uh, for, sh for show animals. But, uh, but uh, as far as uh, the sheep experience, I'll be the first to tell you, what I see at the stockyard when it comes to sheep is, is what I know and what people tell me, so I'm not gonna be a sheep expert. Um, but, and I'm not really going to be a goat expert, but I'll uh, listen, and, and there's probably more knowledge in this room from producers that have done trial and error than what I could probably stand up here and give you in a two or three hour um, orientation. But, so first of all, uh, you know, we're all going to start out with our, having our product. We're going to purchase our animals, um, but prior to doing that, we're all going to need to look at uh, having um, the... Uh, Facility set up, and I'm not going to get into a great deal of depth on uh, fencing and, and the whole nine yards, but I will touch on it. Um, with my knowledge of goats, the stronger the fence, the better. The old saying, if you can throw water through it, a goat can get through it as well. And so <laughs> sometimes that seems to hold true, but a lot of it depends on what actually uh, breed of animals you're, uh, of goats uh, that, you're, that you're raising, uh, Nigerian dwarfs or pygmies. Of course, they're going to be a lot harder to contain uh, than maybe dairy goats or, or your boar or other size meat goats. But again, uh, just keep that in mind. Um, so, you know, like at our own place, uh, you know, and of course, if you've been to Tractor Supply or Rural King or any of the uh, farm supply stores, uh, there's tons of fencing out there. Um, and so, you know, when you look at that, what I like to look at is, uh, you know, most of my dairy goat producers, um, us included, uh, we disbud, we disbud. And so the type of fencing that it takes to hold a dairy goat that's been disbudded might not be the same as it's gonna take to hold a boar goat that uh, you know you're, you have breeding and have horns. And, and I say that because this is our trial and error right here. We put up uh, the 16 foot cattle panels made like a 40 by 40, they get expensive, I do know that. The first thing they do is get up on it, stick their head through it, and then you got horns stuck. And there we are cutting up this nice fence panel, <laughs> trying to get horns back out when they don't turn their head. Uh, so then we decided to go into the sheep and goat um, fencing that you can buy that's rolled fencing. Uh, it comes 330 foot rolls. It's expensive. We spaced our post out every 10 foot, and then we were going in putting T post in between every 10 foot because those things like to push on them. And when they push on them, what happens? It makes your wires sag. So it's a lot of trial and error, but uh, again, that's, uh, you know, when you go to purchase your, uh, your fencing and uh, set up your facility for, for goats and sheep as well. Um, I'm, you know, I don't know if sheep climb on fence, push on fence, get as uh, involved in, in the fencing part of things with sheep as, they, as these goats. But again, uh, there's all different kinds out there. Um, they can be as... Um, Minimum cost as you want and can be homemade. I've seen people do pallets for fencing. You know, you have to collect a bunch of pallets, but if you're going to, you know, 
um, fence off an area for, for these animals, which might not take a lot, uh, then, uh, you know, th those might be a good option. But again, uh, there are tons of uh, fencing options out there to get yourself started. And I always recommend a little shelter. It doesn't have to be an elaborate barn. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, one of these famous horse barns that you see out on the road as you're driving up and down the road. We use three-sided structures. Um, they, can, they don't have to be very tall. Um, you know, again, trial and error. We built one that was like seven foot tall because I wanted to be able to stand up in it. They did not like it. I don't know if it was too tall, but we put one out that was about four foot tall that I had to break my back every time I wanted to go in and out of it. They loved that shelter for whatever reason. I don't know if it was because it was smaller and more confined and they felt more safe in it. But again, um, you know, that's all again a trial and error. And, but, you know, I do recommend um, starting out with, uh, you know, having, having some sort of shelter. Goats uh, especially do not like to get wet, so they will congregate in the rain in those shelters and so forth. So it just helps your overall herd health as well. Um, so then, uh, you know, so we've, we've covered those two topics, you know, then we'll, we'll get into the, uh, you know, food and water. Of course, everybody knows about that. You know, uh, you can feed as low quality feed as you want and, uh, or you can feed as expensive feed as you want. There's, there's all ranges of feed out there um, at your disposal. Um, you know, I would talk to other producers, uh, find out what's worked for them. What, you know, hey, my animals have done good on this feed. They haven't done so good on this feed. This, you know, 16% uh, ration has done a lot better um, performance than my 14%. Uh, so again, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of that goes into uh, to to feeding the animals. Um, I'm a big proponent of creep feeding, and that's going to get here on the market side of things when we start looking at some of these uh, uh, market trends and market prices. Um, but again, if you can creep feed. I highly recommend it because you will see a, a lot better gain uh, on your animals and their performance, especially when they're not trying to fight mom and big goats and so forth um, for feed. You know, that it just, it's just, a, as Dr. Ely told me, who was at UK, he said, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways you can mismanage animals, but creep feeding is one of the ways that you can manage for a better quality product in the end. So, you know, him, he had, by him telling me that, I've taken that to heart, and so anybody that would ask, say, hey, uh, creep feed, you'll see a, you'll see a better uh, performance when it comes to the marketing part of things. So, we, you know, we kind of cover that topic. We get into those, um, you know, the, the food, water, shelter, you know, fencing. Uh, and so it doesn't take long if you start out with five goats or five ewes. Your herd doubles in no time. You know, one breeding season, and before you know it, you've got plenty of animals on the ground. Uh, you know, so so it depends on what your operation's like. Um, if you're into, you know, breeding dairy goats and you're, you've you got plenty of uh, does out there and you want to have replacement does and keep those does, uh, you know, that's great. Um, but what are you going to do with all the boys? You know, some people that have a, uh, a closed herd, um, meaning it's been CL tested and so forth, and I'm not gonna get into all the specifics on, uh, on uh, medi the medical part of things and, and parasite control. That's gonna be brought up at later dates, I'm sure, and throughout the, the speaking speakers today. But, um, you know, what it boils down to, if you're selling those animals off the farm privately and you can get that and you have a, uh, you know, a, um, uh, a herd that is, is all um, full blood and they're papered, uh, you know, you might have a herd that other people are looking to buy those bucks, um, be it boar, pico, sonnen, any, any of the goat breeds, you know, even all the way down to your dairy and Nigerians and so forth. But, again, so you're not going to be able to keep all of those animals as much as we all like to have our goats as pets because I'm, Lord knows I'm feeding plenty of pets right now. So, um, but uh, so where we come in with the Department of Agriculture and – we're here to work for the producer, um, but with these graded sales. So, you know, so we're going to touch into the end result. So you've started your herd, you've got set up, now you've got an abundance of animals. 
what are we going to do with them? And they haven't been able to, you know, you can advertise them on Craigslist, you can advertise them on Facebook, all the different, you know, social media outlets, uh, word of mouth, you know, of course, you can advertise, posting it up in your local uh, farm supply stores on a poster board that you had these animals for sale. But if they do not sell and you're feeding them and you're re ready to get them off the feed bill, then uh, that's where we'll come into play in the stockyards and the KDA is here to help the producers to be able to have a outlet for those animals. Now that being said, before I get into the graded sales, there are plenty of sales out there uh, throughout the state at different stockyards that do not participate in a graded sale. So what they'll do is, uh, as if you take your animal uh, to that particular location, they'll put a head tag on it, just like you would if you saw, saw some animals at a, uh, at a cattle sale. They're going to back tag it, and they're going to sell those animals individually. And there's nothing wrong with that. We don't, KDA only handles the graded sales, so we do not at those um, locations for those particular sales that are just done by the head. So you don't see any marketing reports that'll be done on that through uh, the USDA marketing report websites. Um, so, but again, th that's another outlet um, that, that you have. But then we get into actually our, um, you know, graded sales where KDA, myself, or some other employees are at that uh, will grade these animals. And getting into the graded sales, and hopefully I do this right. All right, so what is a graded sale? Sales where animals are put together in like groups on common grades. So basically, that's it in a nutshell. We try to put, if you've got a group of dairy does, um, it might not be your own. You may have brought one dairy doe in, or you may have brought one boar doe in um, that weighed 100 pounds, so, so to speak. So what we'll try to do is at a graded sale, if somebody else brings in those type of animals that you brought in, We'll put those in a pen together to grade for the buyers who are purchasing those animals. Uh, now, and I, I will kind of, we start talking about does and stuff, and we'll get into the kids and the, and the prices here in just a second, and I'll explain a little bit more. But when you get into the does and uh, ewes, uh, keep in mind, if you bring in any animals, if they're cull does or non-breeders or, or of that regard, I, I would always like somebody to tell me um, because it, if the animals are going to go back to the farm, we need to disclose that, and that's where we help the buyer and the producer because you're going to have slaughter prices that are going to bring a certain amount. But uh, you know, and we'll like to put those non-breeders into those. You know, we don't want them to be back into production and somebody have them for two or three years. That thing never bred. But so if it, as a producer um, bringing into a graded sale non-breeders, you know. Please disclose that I ask because I, I've had a couple of people say I bought some here that just never would you know produce. But uh, again, so we'll look at uh, you know we try to put those those animals together. But if you do have some that are hey I'm just needing to get rid of some and I've got some bred does and I don't have enough room for all the ones. So these are the ones I'm calling, but they are bred. Let me know I can sell those animals as well as a. Um, you know, as bread dough packages. So somebody, that, a farmer may want to take those back home, of course, and, uh, and kid or lamb those animals out. So, you know, if you'll help me to help you, it helps the buyer and helps the farmer who's purchased those animals as well, and it keeps our graded sales. We'd like to say, you know, it, it pr provides confidence in what we're doing for the producer, but also for the farmer who's there to purchase or also for the buyer. So that, that's another big thing is confidence in what, we're, what we have available for them at these graded sales. So that's basically, you know, what, what a graded sale is, is putting these animals in together in like, uh, like groups. So what are the benefits of a graded sale? So as we have here on our PowerPoint, we can provide a volume of animals in a group which reduces transportation costs. So what's that mean? So the more animals that are in that pen and the slaughter buyers, order buyers uh, who are purchasing these animals, they can cut down on the trucking costs because if we have, you know, 50 or 60 lambs in a pen, they can buy a volume of animals and have those all shipped on one load to their facility versus having to go and collect, you know, eight or ten here, you know, five or six there, which is going to cost them more in fuel. So what that does is that gives them, you know, like I say, they're, they're, they can buy a, a, a volume of animals at one location 
without having to spend extra money on gathering up animals um, and saves them, saves them fuel cost, but also gives them a, uh, the ability to buy you know, a great volume of animals. Animals are consistent in grades, therefore buyers can meet their market needs. So basically what that is, is so we, and as you'll see in a couple slides down, what we grade weight-wise, especially on lamb and kids, is what I specify. Um, but the, so, you know, we'll try to put all these animals together in these graded pens, and we'll grade on different levels. Uh, you know, we have high choice and prime choice and low choice, and you'll see that. But uh, so that also provides confidence to the buyer or the packing houses that are buying these animals that they are getting the quality of animal in that pen as how I've graded them. Now, that being said, I might, sometimes I might not be the most liked person because somebody may say, yeah, all my animals are the best. You know, you put your hands on them, wool hides a lot that's underneath. Um, same with goats and sheep. So, you know, I'm not there to, um, you know, make the, the animal less than what it is, but I can't make it more than what it is because once that's going to lose the confidence of the buyers who are purchasing these animals and it throws the graded sale into turmoil and they're, you know, they're going to be mad at me, you know, that I've uh, maybe not graded, you know, correctly, I, you know. So, again, um, you know, I, I'll grade the animal. You know, if my best friend or my mom came in and she had the same type of goats that would go in a, a, a number three category, I'm going to grade them as such. And uh, if somebody asks me why, I, I, and my slides will say here in just a second, you know, you can't show favoritism, and I'll be the first one to stand up here and say I don't. Um, and, uh, you know, but if you have a question and you're a producer that uh, comes to one of these graded sales and you have a question about uh, how yours graded or why they graded, please ask me. I'm there to help you. Um, again, it goes back to uh, management practices and so forth, but please ask me. I'm more than ha happy to talk to you. If I can't do it right there for real busy, uh, you know, and you stay for the sale, see me after the sale. I stay and do the market reports for them. But, again, if I've got a minute just to discuss those animals while I'm doing it, I, I sure will with you. So, please, um, you've got my information. You'll see me there. Talk to me. Um, all right, moving on, we've got um, the, the market data. So, basically what this does is it will, the, U, the USDA allows us access to do the market reports. So, at the end of, during the sale, in real time, I'll put in all the uh, information as the animals each group of animals are sold. At the end of the evening, those animals are on the website for USDA. You can see real-time um, data on what the prices were that day. Uh, and then you can also, and it might be, I, I've done a couple videos with the goat and sheep producers um, with Kelly Yates over at the development office. Um, if you're not familiar with them, we have a meeting coming up Saturday and I'm kind of get off subject, but Saturday is the annual producers meeting. But they have a website, Kentucky Sheep and Goat Development office.org I think it is but somewhere in there you can probably google it and it'll bring it up but I've done a video on how to read a market report and how to find uh, old market reports so you can look back a year ago or back a month ago so there's the information out there that shows you uh, the trends and then that'll help you make an informed decision on selling your animals as well so what uh, now we get on to, that was the, the buyer side now we get over on to your, your all side the producer side so what, uh, what a graded sale also does is help the speed of commerce for shorter sale times. And what I mean by that um, is if you're selling each one of these animals at a non-graded sale, they may be there for four or five, six hours selling them one by one, you know, each one individually. Well, where we can put these animals together in a graded sale and have a group of animals, there's less time that these animals stay in the stockyards, which then returns uh, you have less shrink on an animal it means it's it's going to lose less weight from the time it's brought in and weighed to the time it's sold and and got to the facility the packing houses uh, when they when a buyer or these slaughter facilities um, buy these animals when they say they weighed 60 to 80 pounds weight range when they get there they still want a 60 to 80 pound weight range animal they don't want them ones that have been uh, st stood in a stockyard or stood on a trailer or so forth uh, for several hours and, and now they weigh 57 pounds. They want to get what they paid for. So that's what a graded sale helps does. It will speed up the, uh, the speed of commerce. We get those animals in, we can get them sold and off the, and, and off the uh, stockyard floor a lot quicker by having multiple animals. 
Uh, of course, then that led to the reduced shrink, which is less weight loss um, the animal will take on during its uh, time on the stockyard floor. Um, we have multiple stale locations, um, and I'll get to, I've got a slide on showing where those are um, that you can write those down. Um, and then um, we can help um, also with the market trends, helps identify better sale times. Like I explained earlier, you have times of year they're going to be a little better than others. Um, for right now, as producers, you're probably seeing the best prices you've seen in a long, long time, maybe historically higher than what you've ever seen as a producer. Um, and, you know, I always call these animals the four-legged stock market because it seems like, the, just like cattle, if you're, anybody's been into cattle and got over into goats and sheep, they go up and down. But right now is historically high, and uh, from what our trends are showing, um, right now there's no signs of slowing down. And uh, so, you know, we kind of ask, you know, what drives those trends and why are they historically high? Well, you know, the, the food for thought is, you know, of course, the ethnic market drives most of our goat and sheep prices in the United States. There's been more of an influx of ethnic people moving into our metropolitan cities, and that's where most of these animals are going as a finished product, as the meat. They're, you know, you got the, the ethnic market itself, uh, revolves around holidays. Um, you know, Kelly Yates over at the, show, at the Sheep and Goat Development Office had always told me, she, and, and her speaking and listening to her, do not follow the ethnic holidays. You will drive yourself crazy trying to follow them. But there are certain times of the year, you know, we talk about Easter and Christmas and things of that nature, that these prices seem to generate a little bit more money. This past year kind of threw us for a loop because what happened was, prior to that, we might have had, you know, 325 a pound, 50 pound sheep, and I'm just using this as an example. Well, that was February, March. Well, we hit that April, prices backed up to like 295. Well, what happened was, everybody was trying to hit that Easter holiday. It flooded the market with the animals. It's all supply and demand. When you had a whole lot more animals on the market, prices came down. But prior to that, these animals were sky high, and still, still sky high for historical prices. But the, uh, you know, if you, that, and what I tell you is, is that ethnic holidays are hard to follow because of the lunar calendar and how it changes. So it, it's off by 11 to 12 days each year from what it was the previous year. And they go on a 28-day holiday uh, or calendar versus a 30 to 31 day. So there's a lot of different factors that take place in that with the ethnic holiday. But that's kind of been the trend normally is with the, the ethnic holidays. What we look at now is there's a lot more ethnic people in the United States that are consuming these goats and sheep year-round and not just on holidays. That, you know, it may be a birthday, it, you know, just, just any kind of uh, get-together that, that they may have you know, it's throwing the um, um, animals that they need, um, or excuse me, it is increasing the demand for the animals that they want for year-round consumption. So then we're going to look into, uh, talk about the grades of animals. And, that, and we'll go to, I know it's not up on the slide, but we'll talk about, um, first of all, like our does and ewes. So, how many people sell at the graded sales or have been to a graded sale in here? Okay, so we got, we got a couple here. Okay, so what we'll do at a graded sale, just to give you all a, a little information. So like we talked about, put these animals in light, you know, quality um, pens um, with each, you know, with, with, with the animals. And I can't base it on color. Uh, sheep, you know, they come in different colors. Goats come in all different color, shapes, sizes. But what we'll do is, especially our, our does and ewes, um, if they, we, we kind of grade them into thin, mediums, and fats or heavies. Uh, so, and that's all going to be based on weight, their you know thickness and things of that nature. So you can just kind of picture you know a, a thin doe. Um, she may be not having teeth left. She may be an old you know nine or ten year old doe or you. Uh, she, you know she, she might not be in bad shape health wise, but just nutritionally wise, she's probably gone downhill. She's you know lambed out, you know, five or six seasons, and she just wore down. But so we'll, we'll try to put those in weight ranges based on their condition score. So I'll look at it, thin, 
you know, it's going to show a lot of bone, hip bone, backbone, so forth. Same thing with uh, your does. And then we go for mediums. A lot of mediums go for slaughter uh, because they don't want to pay, the, the slaughter facilities don't want to pay a lot of money for heavy does, which are all fat. So we'll have fats or heavies as well. Um, so when you see an animal, when I, what I'll do at a, at a graded sale, when we get done grading, um, I have a sheet that I keep up with during the sale, and I write down each pen at each location, what's in that pen, uh, you know, so then at the end of the sale, I'll make up a, a sheet, and I'll put each pen description on that sheet. It has their weight range, or their weight average, but I have to write in what that particular pen consists of, so fat does, thin does, medium does, used, and so forth, and then uh, they'll pass those out. They'll print a bunch of those off, pass those out to the buyers, at the sale, um, so they know what's getting ready to come in the ring, but they can also know the description that I put on there. So uh, just to kind of help you out, to, is, is there is a description of each pen put on at one of these graded sales that I make up. Um, so now we're going to get into to our sheep, and so we'll get into to the lambs here. So um, and it kind of follows on both with the sheep and goats, but you'll see um, right here if we talk about our um, number one, sir. But in the sheep part, they're going to be considered, you'll see, prime and choice. So what is prime and choice? So basically when I fill those animals, I want to fill about a half inch or more fat covering over the spine and ribs. So when I put my hand on that animal, if I feel very little to no spine and very to little no rib just by a firm press on each one of those animals' backs, that's how I'll consider this animal is prime and choice. You can look at the best looking animal that comes in there that's nice and wool and looks like it has a back as wide as this podium right here. And if it's a wool, I might be able to put my hand all the way around it. Sometimes wool and hair can be very deceiving. So if you see me putting my hands on these animals, that's what I'm feeling for. Um, you just cannot go by when it runs by looking at an animal and going, oh, that looks like a prime because you will, you, you know, you can, you can get it wrong a lot of times because these animals do, you might, might not have the covering. It's, they're covered by wool and hair. <laughs> so, um, again, that's what you, you'll see me there. I'll be doing a lot of feeling and, and putting hands on. And I do have stockyard helpers that are there, there too. I can't be both places at once trying to pin them and, and so forth. But, again, with, that's what we're feeling for is, is the uh, covering on the animal for the prime's high choice. Then we get into our choice. They're going to have about a half or a quarter of inch or uh, less of fat covering on the spine. So when I put my hands on that animal, again, I, I might, without much pressure, I can feel just a little bit of the spine, maybe a little bit of the, the top of the rib, not much, but I can tell, you know, it's got covering on it. Um, so that's going to put that animal into the choice. And I, and I use, yeah, I've, I've used like prime and high choice. So that's your, you know, your top quality animal. Then we'll get into the, uh, the choice. And then as I, we get down to our select and low choice, that's basically the animal has very little to no fat curve. As soon as I put my hand on that animal, I feel all backbone, feel all rib. A lot of times you're going to see its hip bones and pin bones sticking out. Um, it just does not have enough covering on there. You also see those things also listed as feeders because um, more than likely they're not ready to be slaughtered. You can have 60-plus pound um, lambs uh, that don't have hardly any meat on them, and uh, there's probably going to be somebody there that buys a lot of uh, feeder animals. They're going to take those, uh, those uh, groups of animals home. They're going to probably feed them up for another 45 to 60 days, get a little bit more meat on them, try to get them to that choice category, then, uh, then probably resell them or send them off. might have a contract with one of the buyers, and they just go ahead and feed them out for them, and then the buyer will um, buy the animal directly from the farmer that uh, bought those animals. But again, that and we, we'll, um, you know, that's on our sheep or our lamb side of things. Uh, we'll get over here to goats. Of course, they're listed a little differently. Um, they instead of using prime and choice, they use selects one, twos, and threes. But the same principle applies. Little um, on the uh, on your select ones, uh, you're going to have um, half inch or more of covering on those animals. And I'm going to be the first to tell you when you get into a uh, select one goat it takes a lot to make a select one goat and uh, as goat producers may know uh, but the majority of my select ones are going to be a lot of boar influence they just pack a lot more meat um, on on the on the animal itself 
but you're going to have a lot more boar influence. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and tell you boar is better than this and that. I'm not into that part of things, but I'm just saying overall, um, I'll see a lot more boar influence on my number ones. And then you're also going to see the show kids. Those are the ones that, you know, they didn't sell after the, you know, state fair or North America. They bring them back in. They're just sold at the stockyard through the, uh, you know, through our graded sale. But the majority of the animals out there are going to be our number two. There's going to be times you're going to see these number twos. They're going to outsell the number ones on price. Um, what it is is you're, the, the buyer on those select twos can get a mass quantity, and they are ready to, to go to slaughter. Uh, whether they're 50 pounds, 45, 50 pounds, they will slaughter them that little all the way up you know, to, to 100 pounds. So, again, um, you, know, you don't have to shoot for a select one or overfeed um, to try to get to a select one uh, when your select twos are also bringing premium money. And again, the select twos, half inch to, or quarter of inch to half inch of uh, covering over the rib and, and uh, spine. Again, same way with the sheep and uh, with the lambs, or, you know, you're just gonna feel a little bit of spine, a little bit of rib, but not much on the, on the pressure of, of when I touch those animals. And then, of course, your select threes, they also will be used as um, some of those they'll go on to slaughter depends on how big they are but a lot of them they're going to be fed out a little longer somebody's going to buy them feed them out try to get more weight on them get them to that number two then resell them and then anything a lot of feeders we consider under uh, 45 pounds so we have a lot of animals that come in um, in that 30 to 44 pound range i'll just put those all into a pen by themselves um, and those are going to go to feed um, i've got across the state i've probably got about seven or eight individuals that feed um, on a consistent basis but there's also um, some of these animals are going out west um, you know to uh, Colorado has a huge uh, feeder market out there so a lot of these animals are going out to a to a feed yard you know you hear about cattle having you know your feed yards or finishing yards same way with goats and sheep there's not as many of them of course but there are yards out west that will finish these animals out that are buying these feeder size under 44 pound um, sheep and uh, sheep and goats. So here we go. If you want to write this information down, if you're a new producer or uh, looking to have uh, your animals uh, marketed at a graded sale, we have our dates and locations. Of course, uh, United Producers Bowling Green. They're the second and fourth Thursday of each month from 9 a.m. Now they receive animals from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., and I'm grading animals at, during that time. Then we'll break for lunch, and then we have a uh, 1 to 3. That's kind of liberal. Sometimes we'll go to 3.30. depends on how many people are in line. And then they'll have their sale at 5 o'clock. That gives us time to get the – on all these uh, um, sales, you'll see there's kind of a little lull time between uh, – and I'll tell you what the sale time is versus the receiving times that are shown on our PowerPoint here. But they'll start selling at 5, and that just – that time frame from the, when we stop receiving to when the sale is gives me time to get the sheets made up with the description of each uh, pen that's uh, being sold that day. So it just gives us a little time to get all that information and for the yard to get it put into their system and to get the uh, sheets printed out for the buyers. Then we have Bluegrass Richmond. Uh, that's the second and fourth Monday of each month from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. They start selling hogs at 1 o'clock or thereabouts, uh, but uh, then sheep and goats follow directly after. Uh, then we have Mayfield, which is in far western Kentucky. I don't know if we have anybody that traveled that far up here today, but I was down there Tuesday. It's about a four-and-a-half-hour drive for me. We have once-a-month sale down there. Uh, they're the third Tuesday of each month. They receive animals from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., and then they'll uh, sell at 6 o'clock. Then we have Paris Stockyards. Um, and make note that they have started a, uh, a second sale, and their second sale is going to be the second Tuesday of each month. They used to just be the f uh, last, uh, t uh, the fourth Tuesday of each month, but they have added that second uh, Tuesday of each month sale. So now they are selling twice a month. And of course, their times are um, Tuesdays um, from 8 a.m. to noon. Sale starts at 2.30 now. So that's what time they'll, they're, or excuse me. Two, two o'clock, two o'clock. They start to sell at two o'clock. It used to be 3.30. They backed it up. Now they are selling at two o'clock. And then once a month on a Saturday, uh, the third Saturday of each month, 
down in uh, Washington County at Springfield Livestock Market, um, and they receive animals from 8 a.m. to 11 to 11 a.m. And then we try to start the sale about one o'clock. Depends on what time we get done grading. So, again. There's plenty of opportunities. Uh, we try to set up enough graded sales across the state to give anybody that wants to participate in one of the graded sales a, I hate to say a centralized location, but a hopefully a location that works for you to participate in that. There may, like I said before, there may be yards uh, that are closer that sell goats and sheep. Uh, they might not be graded sales, but it may be closer to you. And again, that's fine. Um, you know, we just don't work at those yards or grade animals, of course. So um, those animals, from my understanding, they still still bring good money. You know, so I'm not not I'm not knocking them because I don't work them. I'm just saying there's a you know these are the graded ones that we'll be at to to help producers out. So what I've done here, um, and if you all show up for the. Uh, meeting Saturday for the Goat and Sheep Producers Annual Meeting. You'll see this slide again. I'll probably get about the same speech. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, I've, what I've done here is I've taken these um, animals, I've kind of broken it down into uh, um, different weight ranges. And I guess I should back up a little bit here and kind of explain the weight ranges. I, don't, I didn't specify it in, uh, on the slides, but what we'll do is we'll, um, any animal that is slaughter animal are broken down into your uh, lambs and kids, both are 45 to 60, 61 to 80, 81 to 100, and then we have 100 plus. But 100 plus can be a 110 pounder or 150 pounder, you know, especially if it's a wool lamb versus a hair lamb, you know, so forth like that. But I didn't get anything really over 100, you'll see a big price uh, drop off on those 100 plus pounders, so I kind of kept it at what the normal market for slaughter is that the buyers are wanting, and that's uh, going to be, um, so I started out with our 100 plus, or I did 100 plus on the wool and hair, and as you can see, I mean, th th they're still extremely high, um, and this is all the way up through September um, when I did this, so, uh, you know, you can look at these uh, these prices, and, and you can go back and uh, compare them to last year, or maybe 10 years ago, if some of you all been in the industry that long, and like we never saw these prices before, especially on 100 plus pound animals. And so, um, and then you're going to see that also on these uh, lighter weights as well. But again, if you just want to kind of look through this, this is uh, what we have seen as far as a trend. There's not a huge difference in the difference of wool versus the hair, but there is a slight difference. I mean, you know, uh, you, you, uh, I can't tell you why there is that slight difference there's probably people in this room that can tell me but i've asked the buyers hey why are the wools a little a little less and they're like i don't know we'll we'll pay the same price but when you get to the same price <laughs> it does show a slight variance in in that but uh again are they far enough from make a, a wool producer go to hair producer or a hair producer go to a wool producer probably not you know at this point in the game it's not um I think the the other thing is, is the hairs, from my understanding, are probably a a little easier to work with because um, these wool breeds get really big and uh, a lot faster. So you know, and against that's all going to be based on what your um, end result is or what your plan is for your herd. So if you want to start out with wool or sheep or hair sheep, you know, it, it just depends on what you all are as far as what uh, the producer wants to do. And then this here looks at last year's prices versus this year's price comparison um, on these uh, heavyweight wool, uh, wool lambs here. And I'll give you all just kind of a minute to, to look over those. Um, again, you know, you, you look at last year in February uh, versus this year in February on um, the, uh, the prices. They, they were up about, what, 14 cents or so uh, last year took a slight dip, but then you hit that March, and uh, you'll see, you know, the wool jumped up and, and outperformed throughout the rest of the year. I'll have buyers at sales tell me, hey, Jason, expect these things to go down next month. Next month, they jump right back up if, as high or not higher. So, again, right now, it's, it, it's hard to dictate what is actually driving the market other than we know, you know, some of the factors being the, the ethnic holidays, the ethnic community and so forth like that, but the supply is still high, and um, 
well, I should say, there's a little less supply, but I'm seeing some producers uh, have more animals uh, for, than they did last year. So we're starting to see a trend, and some of my producers are getting uh, more animals uh, on the hoof, uh, you know, in their production. So uh, they're going to have more lambs. Of course, they might like these lamb prices, so they're going to they're going to try to have more lambs and. And uh, hopefully when they get into the grazing part of the conversation that they're not overgrazing their land just to have more animals in production. So, you know, that can that sometimes can come back to bite you. But again, if you look at these prices, I mean, they're extremely high and, and they have been all throughout this year. And then, of course, I've done the same thing with our, our hair, hair prices and um, on the 100 plus. And I know a lot of this stuff will probably be a little bit monotonous and boring to look at numbers, but it gives you an idea of, of what the market is doing and did last year versus this year. And USDA, I'll go ahead and tell you, when we were doing these market reports last year, they told us, if you do the market report on cattle, sheep, anything you do a market report on, don't put COVID in the... So we have had to stay away. So I think COVID, us up here talking... Probably did a little something, but, uh, you know, we couldn't specify it in any market reports. They would kick that back to us in a heartbeat on our, on our notes. So, And then, of course, we get in. I, I didn't break it down because it was like so many numbers that I had to be working with. But, you know, your 60 to 80 and 80 to 100 didn't see a huge difference. So that's why I did that 40-pound uh, that range. Or, but there might have only been, you know, four or five cents difference at the most in some of these throughout the course of uh, uh, this year on our, um, on our wools and hair so and of course again here's your wool comparison still staying really high staying strong and I'm just going to kind of go through here because I know we're getting a little close to the end here but uh, then we get these lightweights um, you know a lot of people have a hard time selling these animals at 45 pounds thinking they're going to go to slaughter I'll be the first to tell you it seems odd to me too when I first started this but these uh, the ethnic market um, will um, they'll slaughter these things at 45 pounds because there are certain um, ethnic groups that don't want leftovers and I had no idea about some of this till I started this job you know they want a small animal one meal and they don't want leftovers. So they'll slaughter these animals to meet those market needs uh, for those, uh, those folks that are looking for certain, um, you know, weight ranges and so forth. So, you know, keep that in mind. You know, if you, you think you're on the border, just, uh, you know, if you've got a way of weighing them yourself, um, you know, I would. Um, also, I'll, I'll say, put this out there, and I tell most producers there are certain times that uh, your animals may be on that 58 to 60 pound cusp. And yes, they're bringing good prices, but if you can put those animals to that 61, 62, take them another month or two, you might see a little less on your price, but you gain more weight on the average. So that will help you out as well. So keep that in mind. If you, you know, I'm always a proponent of going up for another 30 to 45 days than versus going you know, trying to sell, you know, at that high range of the top dollar, I'd go for the, I like to go to the low range of the, of the next weight because there's, you're putting on pounds, but your average of the pen, and that's what we do, we'll do average of the pen. So that, that'll also help you too. And of course, we're going to slide on through here because um, we're going to get to uh, goats as well. So I've done your select one and twos, and you can kind of tell the difference here. I didn't break these down into weight ranges. Um, you know, we could, uh, I could throw numbers out at you all day, um, and, and it, it'd be boring, and I look at numbers all day, so I can, uh, I can feel what it'd be like to do it, so. Then we'll look at the 2021. Um, you know, look at March last year, those things really hit a big high, and that was right before um, that Easter holiday, and there's a lot of, there wasn't a lot of goats on the market, um, and that's why I had to go back and look at the numbers. There wasn't a ton of goats on the market, and they were needing them, and so that drew, uh, it drove that price uh, way up in the, what, almost 330 a pound, so, um, you know, but again, they, they slid back off, people hit that April and May, um, uh, but again, then when you look at the 2021 20, comparison, um, you know, that was the only outlier that, you know, just, you know, threw the market for a loop if you look at it, you know, from a marketing standpoint. And then, of course, our select two kids in comparison. 
it's what I was saying before, you know, you had 315 um, lambs in March of last year, but they're all still right there almost to that, you know, close to that $3 range. So take advantage of it. And, you know, if you're a producer and you uh, want to uh, market your animals in that 4560, 6180 or what have you weight range, um, you know, if you've got any questions, I, I think my phone number might have been up on there, but I'll put it back up on here in just a second before I, I'm done here. But again, um, here's uh, you know our comparison on our goats. Of course, any additional resources, I know the um, the um, Sheep and Goat Development Office, along with UK, is putting together a small ruminant profitability school, and they're updating some stuff on that uh, with Dr. Ely and Kelly, and uh, I've done a few Zoom conferences with them. Uh, so take advantage of those resources as well. Um, I know there's probably a cost associated with some of those uh, schools that they put on, um, and I think there's some that are free. Um, so again, uh, you can, I know the Sheep and Goat Development Office webpage lists all their information. I'm sure K-State probably puts things out there that they can uh, have uh, additional links and resources to direct you to those uh, other resources as well. So again, uh, do, is there any questions or, oh, I've gone, gone too far. Is there any questions that, yes, ma'am? Um, I'm wondering, do you ever have graded sales for fleece if you're not raising sheep for, for a meat product, but for fleece? Uh, her, her question was, is there any graded sales for fleece? And no, we do not have any graded sales for fleece. And to be honest, I don't even know. My understanding is the price of fleece right now is not real high, but so I, 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 I'd be the first to tell you about sheep. I don't even know where the outlet is um, on the fleece. Um, I know Kelly with the Sheep and Goat Development Office, they have a, um, on their website, they have information that regard, in regards to shearing and so forth and to where the outlets are on that. But as far as from our, we just deal with the meat end of things through the KDA and the graded sales. Second question. Yes. How many sheep or goats constitutes a group? She asked, how many constitutes a group? Well. Sometimes I only get one animal that looks just like itself, and that'll be in a pen. But I've had as much as on during the prime time of the year that people are selling a lot of lambs. Um, I, I'll go. Let me let me say this first. There are a lot more lambs and sheep out there than there are goats. So if you see any information on these things, I'll have a lot more sheep and sheep and lambs sold at a sale than I will goats. Almost two to one, if not three to one. But that being said, I've had as many as 300 in a in a graded pen, and so. Third and last question, yes. um, do you ever sell animals by gender? For example, rams. Uh, we have some extra rams because that's what our use gave us this year. <laughs> okay. Yep, uh, good question she asked about, uh, you know, do we sell them by, by gender? Um, I'll say yes and no. I'm gonna say yes because if they are, you're breeding rams that are older, yearlings are older, all yearlings are grouped in the same category. So if I have a bunch of yearling rams now, again, I'm going to go back to the conditioning of those animals. If it's a real thin yearling ram versus a real nice, you know, 150-pound yearling hair ram, they will be sold separately just because of their condition. But that being said, anything from a year yearling on up in age are sold either in a group of like animals or individually if we don't get that many. But when it comes to your lambs there is no there are certain times of the year that the ram lambs and i must be specifically for hair rams because i get a lot more requests on the hair rams than i do the wool but let's say hair rams there there'll be somebody a buyer that'll let me know prior to a sale put all your hair ram lambs into a pen different from your use and that me. would be regardless of weight that, no, that they well, yes, regardless of weight, because I'm going to do them 45. They're going to be in their weight range, but they're going to be six if I'm if I'm told to do so ahead of time, because we do not sex animals at our graded sales. Um, it would take forever as far as all of our uh, lambs and uh, goats and so forth. If we had to look at every one that came in, we would not hardly get done in the time frame they needed to get I, done. I, I get that. I yeah. mean, for, if you're selling them for meat, they don't care. They don't care. <laughs> but I, I mentioned that because you say 
there are certain times of year they don't want dock tails. They want all hair ram lambs. So there are certain ethnic groups and during their holiday that specify what they need. So our buyers are, are requesting that because they know what product they need to put out there for that group. Okay, so, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. That you were you were asking about the wool the sheep and goat development office does do a wool pool every year wool pool so it's a marketing uh, opportunity for for wool if you're going to sell the wool the fleece so that would be uh, again get with Kelly Yates and she can get you on the list to know whenever that's happening in your area okay yeah, thank you what? I, <laughs> I had yours first I saw them. I've got sheep and not goats but you're talking about them getting their heads caught in a fence? Yes. Sheep just go around to the back, grab their back legs, and just give a pull, and the heads will come out. All now, right. I don't know about goats, yeah. but on sheep it works fine. And you talk about crib feeding. We have found instead of crib feeding, just let, let them pasture on the grass. Yes, you can... Uh, Finish one a lot quicker on your feed, but if you look at what you've got in your pocket when it's over, that pasture, if you've got good pasture, is your cheapest feed that you can feed. All right, there you go. And you're talking about the hair and the wool. Mm -hmm. The reason a lot of them going to hair, like we did, if you look at the price of wool, what it costs you to get them sheared, most of the time you come out in the red. So that's why a lot of the people has gone to hair. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because that is the biggest thing is people don't want to fool with the shearing of these wool sheep, you know, to, you know, throughout the years. So thank you. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. Brush goat grade. Well, we don't have a brush goat, brush goat grade. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, Brush goats, when I ask people, say, you know, because there's certain breeds that kind of look similar to others. Like, I'll say, let's just use a pygmy. You'll have a pygmy goat because they got the dish face and so forth. But then you'll also get some of these Kikos that look like, and you, you got a difference in their height. And uh, so I'll have to ask, is it pygmy cross or is it all Kiko? And they're like, it's just a brush goat. So I'll just say that. But we'll still grade those animals, whether they're brush goat to, to the producer or a Kiko to a Kiko producer, we'll grade those animals based on the same weight and feel and, and the grades one, two, and three, but we don't have a brush, gro <laughs> brush goat grade. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. Uh-huh. Okay. Never, never heard that and, and even, yeah, see. Really? Uh, I, and see, Tess, when I came on, she stayed on with the stockyards for another couple, two or three months, and we just kind of trained together. And luckily, I had a, just enough background to, with the goats, not so much the sheep, because I've learned a lot in the sheep industry um, just by word of mouth or producers that have, you know, told me about things. But um, I've never graded anything as a brush goat. And <laughs> I apologize for that, you know, but. Uh, no, we don't do the, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well, good, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I appreciate you coming back to one of the greatest sales. I really do. And I know I had one right here. Um, I have two questions. The first one I think I know the answer to, but I just want to check. You're, when you're talking about the fat on the, Spine? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the very top of the spine, not the whole? Yeah, so like if, uh, well, just take this chair for example. I know it's not wide, but if you ever take my hand and put over here, I might feel just a little bit of that spine in the palm of my hand. And as I reach down across the top of the loin into the ribs, if I'm not feeling much rib at all in that, or if I have to push through that layer to feel any rib, that's where I'm getting kind of that half inch or so of fat covering. 
um, for a prime and choice. And then as they, if I laid my hand on top of that and I, feel, and I can feel a little bit more prevalent without much pushing um, the spine, but I have to push to get a little bit of the ribs still. It's, it's a guessing game, okay. but, yeah. so you know. So you're tempering that kind of tempering that with the. What's that's it? right. I'm, feel, okay. I'm trying to feel that, that, that okay. loin is what I'm really feeling. But, you know, you can have a sharp spine and it drops right into the rib. So if, you don't, if you've got a prevalent spine, most of the time you don't have a whole lot of meat covering any other part of that. It's going to work its way up so you don't have a whole lot of meat over right. that rib, cover, right. the covering of the ribs as well. My second question was where the, um, I mean, I know Richmond for a while has been doing two, two days, the second and fourth. Um, and then you said that Paris has just added one. I'm wondering when they first added the second day, were there price differences between? No. No. Um, my, most of my buyers at Richmond are the same ones at Richmond um, and, Bo and um, Paris. Then I've got a kind of a I may have some of the same slaughter facilities that have buyers at the other sales, like Bowling Green um, and Mayfield. Now, they're about two and a half to three hours apart, but there's a guy or a few buyers that are within that range. They'll buy at both of those sales. Um, they might be a buyer for another facility that still has buyers at different locations, but a different person that's there buying just because of the, the distance and travel for but. But I do have, you know, I might have two or three different buyers in my Bowling Green and Western Kentucky market that I have at my, you know, Central Kentucky, uh, Richmond, um, Paris, and, uh, and um, Washington County. So it, it varies a little, but there are, you know, still some buyers for those facilities that are slaughtering the animals as well. Yep. Any other questions out there? All right. Well, I appreciate it so much. Thank you all for having me today. Um, I enjoy seeing each one of you uh, as you. Hang on. Yes. Yeah, I emailed that to uh, um, Emily. Um, and then it also, I think Kelly Yates at the Sheep and Goat Development Office, she'll have a copy of it as well. So, yeah, yes, you can to answer your question. But uh, can you get it out there to them from where I've emailed it to you? Okay. Good deal. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I enjoyed being here today. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, if you have any questions for me, did, do I need to put my information back up there? Did you have uh, one of the slides had my phone number and email address? If you need to see that again, we can put that back up. Um, but if you have, uh, I, you know, as you progress into your uh, endeavors, um, please visit one of our greatest sales that suits your, uh, your area. I'll look forward to talking to you, meeting with you, and helping you out as much as possible. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Hello again. Um, today I'm going to, I usually end up talking about something fun like, you know, dogs or something. So uh, another one of my favorite things to do is to take goats out browsing. And, um, that is becoming a really interesting topic these days. So I thought I'd talk about a few projects that we've done over the past couple of years regarding browsing. So you're probably familiar, but browsing just refers to um, eating the plant material from uh, like brushy and, and woody type perennials. And I say perennials because those might be the, the weeds or the invasive species that are growing, but just know that if there are annuals planted, of course the goat's gonna eat that too, right? Like you can't say, oh, don't eat that. But um, these woody things, uh, the things that they're attracted to, what people use um, the browsing goats for um, are mainly the, the underbrush, the overgrown um, forested areas. 
So what is the effect that, it, that browsing has on plants? So you can see from, um, hopefully, from the picture, uh, th they, they are just taking the foliage off. They will eat some of the, the softer woody parts and the, the branches, but they aren't going to chomp into the branches. Uh, so they uh, defoliate at certain times of the plant life cycle, and so that stunts the growth of the plant. Um, those leaves are the solar panels for the plant, so without the solar panel, that plant doesn't have the energy that it needs to grow. So the effect on plants for the long term, um, repeated browsing uh, prevents the regrowth of the solar panels of the, of the leaf. Um, so it prevents the regrowth and the regeneration of that unwanted vegetation. You have to plan on hitting it at certain times of the growth phases. So when when the plant is just starting to um, get its foliage out, if you eat or if you press goats on it at that time, it's going to be a lot more effective than if you hit it at the end of its growing season. Does that make sense? Um, also, repeat repeating throughout the growing season, um, repeated browsing throughout the growing season is going to get a much uh, much deeper effect on um, destroying those plants. So why do goats rock at doing that? If you have goats, you already know they're very inquisitive. They're very curious. If there's something new, they're going to go find it. They're going to stick their nose in it, put their mouth on it, bat it around. Um, and goats, unlike sheep, prefer to eat with their head up. So they like to eat above their head. So they naturally are wonderful browsers. And they prefer uh, foraging, on, supposedly, according to some research, uh, prefer foraging on rough and steep land over flat land. Um, and they're willing to eat browse, which not all animals, not all other species are willing to eat the browse, and they actually prefer it. So studies have been done and show that if given the choice, they will choose 60% of their feed to be, or their, their forage to be from browse than just um, pasture. They're also very comfortable on their hind legs reaching to eat so they get higher, they can get higher into um, canopy. They'll also work in teams to knock down little saplings, which I think is hilarious. It's awesome, and there's usually one big goat that will do it, and then there's others that will follow, and then the whole gang comes around and, and chews it. And they prefer to eat from top to bottom of a plant, and so they more uniformly graze the canopy than other species. So some of the benefits of um, browsing are the land management. So it, it's a tool. It's not a solution. It's not the answer. It, it is a tool to use in land management. Um, so you can use less chemicals and less herbicides. Um, and it recycles the nutrients from the plants back into the soil because when they eat they defecate, right? And so that goes back into the soil. Um, so some of these areas that have been depleted of, of good nutrients in the soil um, are being able to turn over again because they are now getting um, nutrients from the goats that were actually eating the vegetation on there. So they are a tool in clearing invasives, which can allow the natives to reestablish themselves. So some people are fearful of having goats browse in areas that there are native species growing. Um, whereas if that area can be clear,
cleared of the invasives, the natives are going to have a chance, more natives are gonna have a chance to grow. So it's kind of a chancy thing. So the frequency and severity uh, of the browsing is gonna determine the effectiveness. So if you, uh, browse it until it is completely bare. If you browse an area until it's completely bare, that's very different from browsing it to where there's just a few, you know, there's, there's some foliage left. If there's some foliage left, the plants are getting the energy and can put more, more foliage back and they can keep growing. So hitting it again, so in, in like four to eight week intervals, you can put goats on land four to eight week intervals throughout the the growth season um, is the most effective way and it's also free food like that's free food like you're not feeding your goats if it's <laughs> it's there i mean it's out there for you um, so if you're leasing your goats this minimizes your feed costs. Um, or if you're not leasing your goats and you have browse available on your land, you can continually provide um, food for them, nutritious food for them, by managing how you browse that area, how you, how you place the animals on there. So if you don't have them eat it all the way to bear to, to the the bare bones, then it's gonna have the energy to reproduce a little. And so you can continually keep browse growing on your land while managing the size of it. So some of our um, browsing projects, so, um, we started at uh, St. Francis School in Goshen, Kentucky. And they have, um, what is, I think we were doing like 20 some odd acres of theirs. Um, we used anywhere from 15 to 33 goats. And that number ranged just because of the availability. And we lessened the amount of goats that we used over the years because the, there was less and less forage available because we kept hitting the same areas. We would put the goats on there early in the, the grazing season, and um, depending upon if we had uh, does or weathers out there, we would, we would pull them um, either, you know, August, September. And then we also, uh, oh, and we also had a guardian animal present out there. there that was a, a large range, and no one was there 24 hours a day. And we also had them there over the summertime. And so the summertime, there are no students there. There's maybe people that run around the track there every once in a while, but we needed to have a guardian animal out there. So um, usually we had a dog, uh, and we did have an alpaca or two that would hang out out there with them. We also did West Six Farm here in Frankfurt, and that started out they just wanted us to, to uncover a cemetery that was on their property, and it was very overgrown. Um, but they didn't want to go in there with a bush hog. They were afraid that they were going to hit headstones and such. Um, so we agreed to do that, and then it turned into an entire summer-long project. And in fact, we just pulled our goats from there a couple of weeks ago. We didn't have any guardian animal because there was the farm manager that lived on site. He also had a dog, it's not a guardian dog, but it was a dog that could alert him to anything that sounded funky. So that was what we used for safety there. So at St. Francis and Goshen, <laughs> that's our little dog Eddie, so he was grazing with them. Um, it was astounding to see the difference year to year when we would go back at the beginning of a season and to see the decreased amount of, 
of forage available for them. There is still forage available, uh, but it took them less and less time. So where I would have um, 20 goats uh, in a space, I you know, and they would be there for a week and a half, I could now only have them for four days or they'd be out of food. So, uh, you know, year to year, I could definitely tell a difference. The last year we were there, I was running through these areas within days. I mean, I would, I would put the, the goats out in an area and they would need to be moved within three days, a same area that I had been with them, for, you know, that they had to stay for a week and a half. So. So when you're browsing goats, there's all kinds of things that you have to take into consideration. And you can see this, uh, this water tub that's, uh, that's there. Uh, that is actually on a pallet and can be moved around. So it's portable and it gravity feeds a waterer. So over here you can see on the left, that is a browsed area, and it has been browsed for many years. The area on the right has not been browsed in the least. So can you see the difference in the canopy there? So there's actually light coming down that's hitting the soil in that forested area, and we're finding ferns growing there. We're finding things that, that have not seen light for uh, a very long time. So they're, they're able to, they're very happy about having, um, having expanded what's growing in their forested area. Then at the West Six Farm, um, believe it or not, the picture on the left is of the same area. I don't have the, the trees, this is on the right, it's a little closer up. Um, but it was that dense, uh, and this is the area that had uh, the cemetery in it. And so we put the animals out there. They probably they were in that area. Um, I want to say a week and a half, and in a week and a half, they <laughs> they completely cleared that area, and we were able to find the cemetery headstones. Oh, I think I went the other way. There we go. So that picture right there with the trees is the same area that's on the right. So this is a good picture to, um, to talk about why there isn't exact data available on browsing projects. So it's very hard to get exact measurements on the forage that's there, or because people want to say, or people want to ask you, um, how many goats do you put per acre? How fast can they clear the land? Those are the common questions that you get. Um, and so I, people can tell you um, from their experience but getting the exact data is very difficult because to measure that, um, you don't know what's in between there. You don't know where the hills and the valleys are. Um, and, and the goats are not going to eat everything that's in there. There's certain things that they may choose not to eat. So it's, it's difficult to, to say exactly you know, the numbers of what it's going to do. So when people are, are browsing land, when they do that for a business or when they do it for, um, for land management, uh, they can make the judgment from experience. And they can explain the experience to you. So they can say, well, it has this much um, edible, you know, the, the forage that they're going to consume. And that's going to determine how many goats they put on it and for how long they're going to put it on. So this um, picture on the left is uh, going into the cemetery plot. And that's the first day that they were there. And the picture on the right is a week and a half later. So it's pretty amazing.
what they do. They, they did obviously knock down the stone wall, <clears throat> but you know, they're goats. That's what they do. That was, uh, we had talked to the people about the, the damage that might occur with the, you know, if there was a headstone standing up, it might get knocked over. This rock wall that wasn't completely secure probably was going to fall down. You know, those are, we couldn't, couldn't tell the goats, no, don't do that. We told them, but they didn't listen. So how, how we go about doing this, or how I go about doing this, this is St. Francis. This is a, just a Google Earth map of St. Francis campus. So I identified the land that needed to be managed or that we were going to browse the goats in. Those are um, the colored areas, so I have like little teal outlines of those areas. There's some yellow and there's some pink outlines as well, and I have different uh, those were areas that I may get to, I may not get to. It just depended upon how fast the, the browsing was going. So I measured those areas because I needed to, uh, to establish the, the, the boundaries and clear the area for the fence. I also needed to check around for hazards and threats. So the area towards um, the, that's on the bottom left that has a little red, there's a dog that lives there. There's a dog that lives in the house that abuts that property. The goats will not, even with a livestock guardian animal, the goats will not go deep into that area. And so that's, that's an area that I have circled just as a, hey, we may not get this one all the way cleared out. So then you have to clear the paths for fencing. So I mark the paths um, for, other, <laughs> for other people to clear them. However, you can clear them uh, yourselves. Here at the farm, we have to clear them ourselves. We have to make sure that, that there's a path for the electric fence and that it will not get shorted out. Because if there's long grass or brush or twigs or water or anything like that that can short out the electric fence, um, you're, in, you're in danger if, if you don't have something to contain the goats or keep predators out, then, um, then there's a problem. So to do that, you can either mow. If it's, if it's a pretty uh, easy, flat area, you can mow to, um, to create just some space for a fence. You can use a weed eater, a bush hog, pruning shears, whatever you need. Um, I've kept all of the, well, I haven't kept the bush hog in my car before, but, um, but the weed eater and the pruning shears for sure. And you set up the fencing and the water. Um, so those are just rolls of electric fence. At St. Francis, we were very lucky and had access to their golf cart, which which was wonderful. So um, I could take their golf cart with the fencing on it and, and go for hours and, and have all of my supplies with me. Um, sometimes you do have to haul that by yourself, though. Um, and then hooking up the water. Uh, so that is a, that's a gravity-fed uh, water with a float. The only issues that we ever have with that is the overflowing. So because these animals are going to be left and, and not necessarily checked on constantly, we need to make sure that they're going to have a constant water supply. So the best thing you can do every time that you're there, every time somebody is looking at it, is make sure that the water is not overflowing because you can drain your tank pretty fast. Then I just make sure that the fence is electrified because that's important. Um, and then I introduce the goats. My gosh, it's kind of dark, but the, the one on the right is goats that are 
just freshly let out into this area that they're so excited to eat from. They get so excited. So you have to manage your resources, your water, minerals still need to be available to the goats. So water, minerals, and you need to uh, keep an eye on the available forage. You can't just throw them out there and, and hope that, that they make it. You have to make sure that there's still forage available for them to eat. And when forage starts to become low, you plan your next move or you start setting up your next field or, or whatever you need to do. Things can happen really fast. So, you know, uh, rain can come and then we can have lots of sunny days um, or rain can come and it can wash out areas. You have to be prepared for that. Um, and, and like I said, from year to year, from season to season, and from browsing application to browsing application, the forage supply can vary. So a place that you were for a week and a half can easily turn into four days the next time that you're on it. So you, you move them uh, because of the health of the animal, and they will also test the fence. <laughs> so that's pretty big. When, when there's nothing left in there that they want to eat, they will, um, they will test that fence. So this is a, a big overview that has so many variables. And I put this together for some people that were interested in um, proposing a browsing goat herd to a city. Um, and they just wanted something to present uh, quickly. So, the costs that are involved are dependent upon many, many things. So the source of your animals, do the animals already exist? Do you already have the animals? Do you have to purchase the animals? Um, how old are they? So, you know, it, it, when you buy them, it's going to cost, you know, the, the age can affect how much it costs, the weight. The sex, whether it's a male or a female, um, whether it is uh, castrated or not castrated, um, all of those things are, are going to go into your initial cost. The equipment that you need, so you need fencing, you need temporary fencing, um, you need an, a, a, some way to electrify it, to have power, to have backup. Um, you need water, you need transportation, so there's, you know, trailers, trucks, what, you know, what, how are you going to get your animals to and from? The labor, so your labor is not free. It seems like uh, a lot of times I always assume my labor is free, but it's not. Um, so figuring that into it, you know, there, there's time that it takes for setup. There's physical stress on your body that it takes to set up. So housing and feed when they're off season. So housing you don't have to worry about during a browsing season, during a growing season, or a grazing season with these guys. A lot of times um, even the shelter is taken care of if they are under a dense canopy of trees. They're, they're fine and dandy. Um, but when they're not grazing, when they're not browsing, where are they going to be? And then you've got to feed them too, right? So I just have, uh, this is so variable again, so this is just a little bit of, of what I put together for them. So your initial goat purchase, so anywhere from 75 to 300 plus dollars per goat, right? Um, so your goat care and food, so about, it, it can be around $350 a year if you talk about your, your feed, your medicine, that kind of thing. Um, your transportation, uh, your fencing, the insurance. So if this is something that you were going to look into as a service or a, a business 
for someone, um, you need to be insured because goats sure can damage property. Um, and they can get out, they can cause problems. You know. um, your labor, your handling equipment. So handling equipment, if all your goats do is browse, that's great. But if they have another, uh, another production purpose, you'll need some kind of handling equipment for your animals, like a head gate, a scale, things like that, to be able to keep track of the health of your animal or treat them if they need to be treated. Your land preparation equipment, so your uh, weed eater, your pruning shears, your bush hog, what, whatever you may need to uh, clear your paths. Your predator control, so if that is some kind of uh, electronic device or you know cameras set up or if that's a guardian animal um, that costs money as well and then their upkeep does as well so waters hoses um, and and again shelter if if needed so your recurring costs are going to be like your insurance your insurance oh, sorry your insurance the labor that's used, um, the care for the food and the medicine of the animals, and care for that livestock guardian animal. So anywhere from 500 to 1,000 a year is normal for um, upkeep on a, a dog. So. so if you were going to lease, this is very general, and there is luckily someone here in the audience that, that can uh, chime in um, with information on this. But there's per acre charges, if that is what, there's all kinds of ways that people charge for the browsing service. Um, there's per acre charges, there's per head per day charges, there's consultations just to go out and speak with someone, just to see what their land is like, to see if it's even an option. You need to get paid to go out to do that. Like, your time, again, is worth something. There's take up, set down, and moving the animals. There's the labor that's involved in that. And there's the daily labor, checking the animals, checking the fence, because there's branches fall on these fences. Um, and if a branch falls on a fence, not only is the electric affected, but the security of the fence, the integrity of the fence is affected. And then somebody needs to check on that water as well. So opportunities for that, for browsing. So, you know, goats like to eat. Um, I'll just go back to, to the, the possible um, the possible money that can be made in that. So just in summary, goat browsing can be an effective way to manage unwanted plant growth. They really do love it. <laughs> They're really good at it. It's free food and it can potentially expand the income of your herd. We always like that, right? That is all of these references. If you wanted to snap a picture, or I can send this out, are really great. There's some really great information out there. And does anybody have any questions or comments or things you want to add? David Neville. <laughs> David Neville does this. I'm sorry? I, I deafer than a doornail, man. <laughs> Test. From a practical standpoint, we do this. As a matter of fact, we have a browsing project coming up. Uh, we're going to go set up on Monday over in Scott County. And there's a lot of demand for it. I've probably turned down half a dozen projects for various reasons this year already. Uh, a couple of them were just too far for me to travel. Uh, a couple of them were really small sort of neighborhood projects that really didn't make sense for our operation. <clears throat> but we'd love to have somebody to refer those to, Emily. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
we do, uh, and we get that question. It's a legitimate question. Well, how much is this going to cost? And I can never answer that question because, as Emily said, there's too many variations. You know, even you know, even during the year, uh, how fast are the weeds going to grow? Right? If we get a lot of rain, weeds are going to grow. If it's pretty dry, they don't. So that that will impact how many goats you put on there, what type of terrain, and uh, how thick the underbrush is. Is it uh, a little bit of browse and a lot of grass, or is it almost all browse? So there's too many factors. So what we do, uh, we offer a, a on-site consultation, and we charge for that, uh, and then we wrap that back into the project if they choose to go with the goats. And I probably talk more people out of not out of doing it than I do into it by just being, you know, honest and what it, you know what it's going to take. Uh, but the big things are really get your fence set up. We use the electric netting as you saw. Get your fence set up properly uh, and keep it hot. If you keep it hot, uh, it'll keep coyotes. And by the way, neighbors' dogs are probably more of a problem than coyotes are. But if you keep it really hot, it'll keep the dogs and predators out and the goats in. But to do that, you got to check it every day and maybe twice a day. And so what we do with our landowners, and landowners by and large want to be involved in the project. They may not know anything about goats, but they have the capacity to, and we leave a little voltmeter with them to go out and check the fence. So I don't have to be there every day, but somebody's there every day checking the water and checking the fence. And, you know, the water issue, a lot of people worry about that, but goats on browse don't drink very much water at all. Uh, we set water tanks out and feed them by gravity or hose or whatever, and we, you know, two or three, four days later, is that much water is gone because they get all that moisture out of the green. Now, when there's no green, you, they, they get water. Uh, the goats will pretty well tell you, after you have some experience, about when to take them off. So what we look for, if there's any cedar trees on the property, and they'll eat cedars, but if there is any cedar trees on the property and they're reaching up six foot to, to get at those cedar trees, it's a pretty good bet it's time to go. And if you don't, they'll go. They'll, go. they'll figure out a way to get other stuff. Um, lots of questions about what they will eat and what they won't. Uh, we've really found, uh, and I have some partners that I work with too, so got a lot of experience. We've really found that goats, while the myth is that they will eat everything, uh, <clears throat> as my granddaddy would say, that just ain't so. So uh, they do have some preferences. So bush honeysuckle, they love that stuff. They'll go right to it and, and the whole herd and eat it down. Uh, Japanese honeysuckle vine, uh, brambles. Uh, and folks worry about the little goats getting stuck by the briars. And they will close their eyes and take their lips and just pick out whatever's green, whatever's green. But keep in mind, it's going to be green. So browsing is not landscaping. Uh, lots of folks think after you browse goats, it's going to look like a bulldozer's been through there. And as y'all saw some of the great pictures, there was lots of limbs and brown stuff and, and all that. So bush honeysuckle, for instance, grows up and then branches out. They're going to strip all the green off of it, but it's going to be left there. Uh, one note about how often you would do this, what we like to do is not, we'll do a one-time thing if the landowners want to, and we'll, we'll explain that. But what we really like to do, it works good. If you go in, say, on, in the fall, hit it pretty hard, take the goats off, come back in the spring when it greens up, hit it pretty hard, take the goats off, and come back that next fall one more time. And I'm not a plant biologist, but the little I know from my farming background is plants got to store some, some carbohydrates to overwinter. So if you take those carbohydrates away the first year, they can still kind of get through the, the, the deal. And then the spring weakens them, and then that fall, it really knocks them out. So, so they have a good chance of, uh, of getting those invasives knocked out. And what also we found, and Emily mentioned this a little bit, is that if you get the invasives out, it opens up more room for the native plants to come back in. Not a guarantee, but it really does a number on the invasives, but the natives seem to kind of enjoy it. So, Any questions from a practical standpoint? Uh, if, if the question is, if you have a lot of cedars, will they work on the cedars hard? 
if you keep your fence hot and keep the goats in there. Meaning, meaning that the cedars are not their favorite, but they will work on cedars. If that. Any other questions? Yeah, they do. I think any livestock, you know, and uh, I'm not a, a, a PhD researcher or anything, but just my experience with livestock, and we do, we have a cow-calf operation, and we f feed out steers. We have uh, pigs. We do feeders to, to finish pigs. Uh, you know, my wife has chickens. We do eggs, and, of course, we have goats and stuff. I think any livestock, uh, if you notice that one's giving you a problem, even if you love her because she's spotted up just right and nice, send her on down the road. And when you do that, it almost tells the rest of them, y'all better chill out. Y'all might take one way trip to town. So the short answer is yes, there are goats that I've gotten rid of because they just give me a problem every single day. Some kind of thing, some kind of thing. And so we just, those, we just move out of the herd. So, so the question is about uh, uh, breeds with better temperament, and I'm going to let Dr. Andrews answer this. Uh, I have Kiko crosses. I like the crossbred goats. I have Kiko Savannah crosses, and they work fine. Okay, the, the question on the temperament, uh, it really is more of an individual thing, but like anything else, you get some generalities. In general... Uh, the Spanish goats are going to be a little more flighty. They're not going to necessarily be more aggressive toward people, but they're going to be a little more flighty. Uh, but if you get into a more browse type situation where they're going to be kind of on their own, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, some of the Kikos, I've seen Kikos that are very friendly. I've seen other Kikos, and a lot of this is based on how they're raised. And I think that's a big part of it. If you have the animals and they're exposed to people early and they get used to people being around, they're going to be less flighty. I have not seen any particular goat breed that I'm more worried about being aggressive to humans, because you were asking about with, with children. I'm not, I have not seen a goat breed that I'm more concerned about being more aggressive toward people unless, you know, but I have seen individuals that are going to be aggressive. Of course, a breeding male is going to be a bigger risk than a female, though I've seen some females that are, are rough as I'll get out whenever they get around and get cornered. Like most livestock, again, the more you get that animal cornered, the more likely it is to wind up being aggressive towards somebody. So I think that's, like I said, I don't think there is a specific breed Usually your boars are going to be more used to being people in general. So a lot of people talk about them being tamer. Uh, like I said, I, you know, my experience is a lot of the Spanish, and you start looking at where a lot of the Spanish breeds coming from, large open range are not used to seeing people. Okay, same thing with cattle. If you get cattle that aren't used to seeing people, you get them in a situation where people are around all the time, all the time they tend to be flightier. So... That's one of the things you have to think about. Most of the goats and almost all of your goats and sheep breeds, because of their size, they're not going to have that huge aggression factor that you're concerned about, like you see more common with some of the breeds of cattle. Okay, so that's, that's kind of why that's that way. And it's, they look at us and say, okay, they're still bigger than me. Okay. Something um, to that the the friendliness towards people especially if you have them out in public is not necessarily a wonderful thing um you don't you don't need an aggressive anything ever but um but having them preferring the attention of a human on the other side of that electrified fence um is is Dangerous. I mean, it, it's dangerous to the person on the other side, and it's dangerous to the goat. So it's nice to have them used to people and used to people walking around them and, and helping them every day or, you know, whatever they need to do. Like, 
at the, the West Six farm, they were, all of our goats were, were familiar with people. And so when people go by on their bicycles, they have, you know, uh, dirt bike trails out there and people jog and have their kids. Our goats aren't going to freak out, but they don't come up to the fence. One night we had, uh, they were having a program there and we had one of our, our um, ambassador goats, Bill, out there um, and all he did was sit and cry for people's attention while he was behind an electric fence. So, you know, that makes people want to go do this and, you know, it's just all bad. So there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fine, fine line there. Aggression is, to me, never acceptable, uh, but overly friendly is not necessarily a good thing. Yes. It's people. I mean, we do it. We, we, we make them pets, you know, so... Um, you know, it, it's just, yeah, bottle, bottle, bottle babies, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's, but, but they, they don't know the difference, you know, you're a, you're a goat in human clothes to them, or they're a human in goat clothes, you know. My wife, loves to, my wife loves to feed goats, our goats, when we have them at our place, peanuts, and they <laughs> jump on her. And she says, why does the goats jump on you or me and they don't jump on you? And my recommendation is if you want to have pet goats, have a couple of pet goats mm -hmm. over here that are, you know, small and, uh, and easily to be handled. And the rest of them, especially if you're doing the browsing, like Emily said, you want those guys out there working. Uh, one other point, too, is the horns. You know, when we got goats, my wife says she was kind of t intimidated by the horns. Can you get rid of the horns? I said, no, them is handles, right? <laughs> the easiest way to handle a goat, right, is just to grab it by the horn. Don't hurt them. Hopefully it doesn't hurt you. Uh, and so that's the other thing is how do you handle goats? I had a friend of mine, an old farmer, say, I can't handle my cattle because he didn't handle his cattle. In other words, if you work with them and they understand what you, what you want, and you have it set up, it's pretty easy to handle goats. Even if they're out some browsing project, and they're like, landowners, how in the world are you going to get them things back on the trailer? <laughs> and uh, I entice them with a little feed, and they go right on. So, yes. Poison ivy and toxic berries. Well, uh, prior to doing the browsing thing, my wife had two pet goats. And we had some poison ivy on the fence, and the goats love it. And she went to work the next day, and the girls at work said, what's that all over your neck? Didn't hurt the goats at all, but spread the poison ivy all over my wife's neck. So actually poison ivy there, it's not toxic to them. Now poison berries, so that, that's a broader question than just one thing like poison ivy. Uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Andrews, if you can answer that, but there probably are toxic stuff. But we haven't found anything that bothers them much. They, if they have plenty to eat, they usually stay away from stuff. Okay, uh, poison berries, it's gonna depend on the berry and what the toxin is, okay? And you asked about hemlock. Hemlock's a very good question. I know uh, another person in the state, the only other person in the state I know who's really doing the browsing for hire and he has stopped doing anything that has hemlock because he actually had lost some goats with hemlock. We have had goats on this farm eat hemlock every year since I've been here without a problem until a few years ago. Again, we had a number of bottle babies and they got into the hemlock. This is something that I'm not gonna say is something to count on, but I have seen goats avoid stuff that's toxic and eat the thing right next to it. I've seen goats eat a little bit of something that we would consider toxic and then eat other stuff and then come back eat a little bit more so they tend to dilute it. It's one of those things, I think whenever I was talking to uh, Al Dealey about the situation he had with the hemlock, 
he had put goats into an area that was almost exclusively hemlock. And what we had happen with the bottle kids is they went and they started eating hemlock and they were bottle kids. There was, mom wasn't there to say it's time to go is kind of what I tell people. So what happened is whenever everybody else left, they stayed eating the hemlock. So there, I, I've watched goats go in, and it, it's interesting if you ever do this, uh, and I've seen it a little bit with sheep as well, but I've seen it almost every time we've put goats into a new area. They go around and they'll smell everything, and then they'll taste some stuff, and then they'll decide what they're going to eat first, what they're going to eat second, what they're going to eat third. And I've seen things with goats that I haven't seen with most other livestock grazing species where I've watched goats sit there and not touch something. And I mean, just, they will not eat this. And then you come back one day and it's gone. And I'm, I'm serious, when we did this the first time with Forge Chicory, left five o'clock one afternoon, came back eight o'clock the next morning and it was gone. And they had not touched it for three weeks, okay? So there is something in some of these things that goats tend to detect, but I'm not going to count on that if I know something is really toxic to them. I'm not going to count on that to protect my animals. I want to make sure there's dilution out there. Yeah, down cherry trees. Uh, you know, the wilted cherry leaves will produce cyanide, uh, or precursor to cyanide, prussic acid. Same thing that happens and why everybody talks about how bad Johnson grass is when it's one of the greatest grasses out there for grazing, just not once it's been hit by a frost until it's had time to dissipate. But you've got a lot of things that are toxic to an animal. Goats are known to do better at processing those toxins than sheep or cattle are. But again, there's a limit to what they can stand. So you have to be careful. But yes, the poison ivy, poison oak, uh, the tree that Emily showed at West 6 when she showed that corner, that was poison ivy going up that tree. The second picture, there was no poison ivy on the tree. The goats had eaten all that they could, stripped it as much as they could, barked it, and killed the poison ivy that was in that tree. Okay, so they will do a good job, but like what, what David was saying is realize that they're going to have that sap and stuff along their lips and all of this stuff on their face, and so if they are real friendly and come... <laughs> they come to do that, or if you start handling them, it's going to spread onto your hands and stuff. So be aware of that if they're in that area. I also wanted to say, and I know uh, don't want to get too much le too late here, but I also wanted to say that I know not everybody in here has goats. Some there are some sheep producers in here. Sheep and goats do have some different preferences in browse. Sheep can be used for some of this stuff as well but realize they're not going to be as targeting the rose bushes and the bush honeysuckle and autumn olives and stuff that the goats are going to go in and hit first. They're, they will eat some of this, but they are not as attracted to that as goats are. So again, when you're planning any of this, you need to think about what is needing to be controlled and make sure your animals... I also have never seen sheep standing up on their back legs to graze up to five, six feet off the ground, and I've seen that with goats all the time. And I've actually seen goats climbing into trees if the branches are right to eat higher up, okay? I've not seen that with sheep. So some of this is getting into, and that's why a lot of goats are used for this, uh, for the, that type of brush control, uh, invasive species control compared to sheep. The other thing I want to say is, and this is a big conversation that's going on in the ag community in this state right now that ties to this. With the increased desire for renewable energy, we're seeing more and more solar farms come into the state. There is a demand right now for people to graze those solar farms. The, con the companies that own them don't want to have to pay somebody to go in and bush hog them. They're looking to be a greener source of energy. So if you have this great source of energy that's supposed to be carbon zero, and then you're coming in with diesel machines to, or gas machines to, to mow it every week, 
it kind of starts depleting that. It also is a way for them to not take that land totally out of ag production. This is something that sheep are built for. We are concerned if goats go into these areas, goats are going to try to get on the solar panels. They're going to chew every wire that they can find. Uh, I actually drove down the, the, to check one of the fields here today since I don't get out the farm that much. We have some goats in a field with a, a temporary shade shelter, and uh, apparently it sagged a little bit, and the goats are now getting on top of it. So they're going to... So McKinley had to go out there and add more straps and tighten it up so they get it up so the goats don't tear up the shade shelter. Goats will get on something if they can. Their, their desire is to climb, okay? I've actually seen goats on top of some of our portable sheds and I never thought they would, but they decided to challenge themselves and see who could get up there first. So that's why we don't want to put goats on these solar farms, okay, unless we get them up high enough to where cattle can, can graze them. But there is a demand these people are looking to hire. The biggest problem I see in it is most producers in the state of Kentucky are small size producers. Most of these, these companies are wanting large numbers because they've got large acres with these solar farms and they want to contract one person to graze multiple units. So this is something that we need to look into. It's something that's getting more and more common today. And it's one of the reasons we want to make sure we are looking into this and how you can manage this. What are the real costs of this? Now, here's an advantage. You're on a solar farm. I'm not talking about free electricity. I'm talking about the fact that they're going to have a perimeter fence around this place. And it's going to be a good fence. It's going to probably be a chain link fence. So now your perimeter fence is taken care of. You're not worried if the animals get through your temporary electric fence like you are grazing a graveyard or a place in the woods or something like that, and them getting out and getting onto the highway. Or Our biggest concern in Goshen was that big, nice new subdivision that was being built when we started this right behind it what are, what's going to happen when our goats get out and eat everybody's rose bushes at their house? They're not going to be very appreciative of it. So we have to be careful of those things as well. Uh, I, I also know we had one question over there. Yes. Yeah. Who are thinking of doing this just, like you say, on your own farm. I do... Um, take bush honeysuckle area, mostly bush honeysuckle areas, and I'll put the goats in there. And then when it starts to get kind of low and I don't feel like moving them yet or I'm not ready, I go out with either a handsaw or a portable little sawzall and I will cut those taller honeysuckles and just dump them down. I try to keep them propped up so they're not right on the ground and they will eat those. And I've learned here that it's nutritious and I, sometimes I'll put them in an area and then I'll go all around the outside of it and cut all those trees and throw them in there till I can move them somewhere else. You need to think about how high you want to leave that cut because you're because of mowing and whatever. But um, it's, it's just really useful. And I've, and I've done it in, and I haven't been real scientific about when I put them in, but after a few years that, that honeysuckle's gone. Uh, one th quick thing, on, and you're right, on the bush honeysuckle especially, you need to cut it. They, if, they, if it's too tall, they can't get tall enough to totally defoliate it. I've seen them strip the bark off of autumn olive. I've seen them strip the bark off of Bradford or calorie pear, but I have not seen them strip the bark off of bush honeysuckle. They don't seem to like the bark or the cambium layer. So that's a way to do that. And what I've told people before, too, is, even if they don't kill it, just like what she was saying, in a lot of these situations, you can't get in there and get through it. You go through, you do a browse run through it, then you can get to that base. You can access it well enough to do a cut or a cut and treat. Uh, I, do, I, we, I think all of the people here talking will be here today, uh, later today. Uh, you had one thing you wanted to add about Scrapey's tags. So uh, let's let that happen before we break for lunch here. And I've got one other thing before we break for lunch. Okay. We good? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, 
one thing before we go to lunch here, um, scrapey tags. Uh, those animals that are being sold at a livestock market have to have a scrapey tag to even be unloaded at the livestock market. So if you're a new producer, I'm going to give you a phone number. If you have animals um, and do not have scrapey tags yet, I'm going to give you a phone number to call. It's to the USDA's office here in Frankfurt, or yeah, here in Frankfurt, um, that they will do your scrapey tag order. There's something about the first so many are free, then after that there's a charge. Um, it used to be all free when I first started into the animal disease traceability part of things, but they have changed since that uh, time frame. But again, 502-848-2054. Again, that's 502-848-2054. That's to place your scrapey tag order. Uh, but they will need to be scrapey tagged before we're being offloaded at a any sale, any stockyard in the state of Kentucky. And that's a USDA and state of Kentucky regulation. All right, thank you. So, uh, and he's right. The scrapies tag is very important. Uh, it's for disease traceability. And uh, the mandate on everyone, I think, is a Kentucky mandate. They, at a certain age, or for breeding stock, it gets into some of the federal, but. 18 months of age or older on certain disease. Yeah. But in, in the state of Kentucky, it needs to have that scrapies ID before it leaves the farm of origin. And what I've told producers as well is if you go to buy animals and you're buying them from the state of Kentucky, remember, they're supposed to have that tag in their ear and that tag stays there. Of course, it can be replaced if it's lost. But it's supposed to be there before you that leaves that herd of origin. So if you're buying them from a breeder, don't take them unless they have that tag in their ear, okay? Uh, it's just, just make sure they have that tag in their ear. Uh, one other thing I want to mention before we break for lunch. Uh, we were asked about the presentations, you know, were they available? Uh, part of the reason for a lot of this setup and why we've got these cameras going that if you've been here before COVID, we didn't normally have. Uh, Third Thursday is still being broadcast on our the Kentucky State University YouTube and Facebook channel. And, of course, anything that's put on the Internet is there forever. So they will be there, and you can find them at KSU's uh, Facebook page and KSU uh, YouTube channel. You'll be able to go back if you want to go back and re-watch any of these presentations. No, that's not a straight copy of somebody's PowerPoint, but you will at least have access to it and be able to hear, not just see the slides, but be able to hear their comments on that. So uh, just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that. Yes, ma'am. At this point, what's going to be up there is going to be the recording, basically, of the of the whole presentation. So it wouldn't be the PowerPoint itself being downloadable, okay? If you are interested in a, any copy of any of the presentations, you can contact that speaker individually or you can contact us and we can get that to you, okay? So lunch is available. Uh, Again, because of some of the changes and things, it's not COVID-related COVID really, but we have box lunches available for everybody. They're out there. Uh, please get your lunch. And I didn't order them, so I'm not sure where they came from or, or what exactly they are, but uh, I know that there are several different ribbons I can see through the doorway. So look and see. Get your lunch, uh, and we will start back at 1 o'clock. So we'll start back with President.
Okay, everybody, uh, it's one o'clock, so we're getting ready to get back started here. If you want to clean up and we'll be back on. Uh, this time, we want to take a few minutes here in the building to give you a quick update and some discussion about some of the research that we've got going on here with the goats. And typically, I would have put together a presentation for this. Uh, I've had a lot of stuff going on this semester with classes starting. Uh, and I'm just going to be honest with you. I dropped the ball this third Thursday, caught up to me, and I have not had a chance to review some of the research results. But I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of what we've got going on, what we've got planning, and what we've been doing recently. We have been uh, working, as most of you know, the last three years, the official research projects, we've been looking at some different grazing intensities with the goats. We've been looking at uh, some selection for improved reproductive efficiency in our animals as well. Uh, we continue to collect some data. We've collected a couple of years worth of data looking at effectiveness of some treatments of parasites uh, at kidding. So we're treating the dam uh, 48 hours after kidding for parasites and seeing uh, what treatment combination we're getting the best use out of. I'm going to start off some with our grazing intensity. Uh, this is the last year of data collection for this series of research projects, so we'll be getting this data, doing some more detailed analysis of this, and then getting ready to start our next research project. So what we looked at is, as, as those of you who have been here to these before know, what we've done is we have three two-acre fields. We put the same number of goats. We were looking at uh, 500 pounds of animal per acre, so we were putting 1,000 pounds of goats on each of those two-acre fields. And what we did is we divided it into different size sections or paddocks for rotational purposes. So we had a four day, a seven day, and a 14 day rotation. So of course the 14 day rotation had a much larger area. Half of that went, uh, we had for the seven day, and a little bit more than half of that, again, for the four day. As I told people before, I've not been, I can't divide seven in half and get an even number, and so we weren't gonna try to rotate on a, you know, except on a daily basis. So we decided to go with four. What we're seeing looking at the data, doing some rough checks on the data, what we've got going on. We're seeing some of the things we expected to see with animal performance. Uh, the four and seven day rotations are doing fairly well with individual animal performance. Whereas the seven day, we're starting to see a little bit of lag behind on actual animal performance, individual animal performance. When we look at some of the other measurements of performance, though, we can run more animals. And what we think is happening on this individual animal performance, realize that they are there for seven days, or for four, four days on, this, on the four day rotation. Then they don't come back for about 90 days. And so what's happening is, I think we have for our environment a little bit too long of a recovery period. So what's happening is our forage is getting mature on us. And as that forage matures, this grass matures, its quality goes down. So what's happening is, while we look at the forage productivity, we're getting really good productivity on this shorter duration grazing we're seeing a decrease in our overall nutritional quality of that forage. Whereas in our seven and 14 day, we're getting back to it sooner, so we're not seeing that decrease in forage quality. Now my problem is when we're doing this project, that was one of the parameters that I didn't start collecting. We didn't do a lot of sampling of the forage to determine if that is really what's happening but we do know that we are getting more forage production. We know that the grass is older. We know that it's maturing, okay? And we think that in enough to at least give us some anecdotal evidence that that's probably why our performance isn't where we want it to be on an animal basis. If we look at the forage basis, that 
shorter duration grazing is giving us better forage production. We are getting more tonnage produced per acre. We are actually getting better utilization by the animals of that forage that is available. They are consuming more of it. So they're doing a much better job. It's just the quality. And this is going to kind of be what I'm planning to start trying to look at in our next iteration is I'm going to try to start looking at what type of forages can we use to start getting some of this performance that may help us out. Uh, I know that there are annual forages out there. We, the forage out here, if you look in our pastures, you'll, you'll know that our pastures are pretty much endophyte infected tall fescue. I know you can't see the endophyte, but that's what they are uh, because we have had it tested. So what can we do? And we've talked about doing annual forages. We've actually got a uh, individual on the farm who's very interested in forages now working on the farm, and he actually has worked, and they've established a field of native warm season grasses. That field was started this year. Uh, if you came up Mills Lane and you saw the pasture out there that was brown, that is the field with the native warm season grasses in it. It's already at the end of their growing season, so that's why it's brown. It's not because it's been sprayed. They have actually established it this year, uh, and they planted them this year, and it's just it's, it's reached the end of its maturity. But can we use that to get the performance we're wanting in animals during the summer slump? So I'm going to be wanting to look at that. We're also looking at the possibility of doing some annuals. I actually have a field where we've done, we did annuals this year. Uh, I still struggle with stands in a lot of my annuals on this farm, and it's something related to this farm. And we struggle to get uh, establishment of stands sometimes. But, you know, can we use annuals? Can we use, use some of the other legumes out there? We, I've wanted to try to get a... Lesbadiza field established for a number of years, which is a warm season legume. It's got tannins for uh, impact on parasite load. So, you know, there's a lot of benefits to it, and the goats will eat it. But if I can't get a stand, that's my struggle. And I know there's people who do have it. There are people who graze it. It is used. It's something going on with our soil and some of our issues on specific to where I've been trying to establish it. But that's where I'm going to take this uh, research next is going to be looking at some of these different forages. It looks like for us that seven-day rotation is probably going to be hit, is really hitting that sweet spot for us as far as animal productivity and forage productivity. So we're getting a lot more forage than the 14-day. Uh, the previous iteration of this was looking at continuous versus seven-day rotation. The seven-day rotation did a lot better with animal as well as forage performance than the continuous grazing. So again, the 14-day was kind of keeping that, well, what if we go backwards? That seven-day rotation is still looking really good for small ruminants. And again, I think a lot of what we've got to do is we've got to work on how do we manage that, getting them in to make sure we don't have a lot of forage that's over mature. Parasite-wise, we are looking at parasites on that because, as most of you know, you've got small ruminants. Internal parasites, especially Hamacus contortus, is a major problem for all small ruminant producers. The best thing we can do is collect data and get rid of the animals that are a problem, select for more resistant slash resilient animals, and genetically get our animals to where they're not having as much of a problem. But we can also manage around this. But most of you realize if you've been to some of the trainings on FAMACHA and other things with parasite, Hamacus has a 21-day outside the animal cycle. Or sorry, 14-day outside the animal cycle. It goes from egg to infectious stage larva in two weeks. So if we move our animals in 14 days or less, the eggs that came out when they came on there are not ready to reinfect that animal yet, okay? So we start to avoid them. Now, I've seen a lot of presentations over the years, and your weather conditions vary, but you're going to be looking at 60 to 90 days to see a decrease in the parasite load on the pasture. So this is where we can't come back too soon 
or we, we're back in the middle of all of this, and of course, rain and all of this stuff plays a role in that. But if we stay out too long, this is what I said I think was happening with our four-day rotation. The grass was getting too mature and our animals weren't performing like we need them to. So again, we have to work on how do we balance this to work out a relationship. And I really think that that seven-day rotation and all of this was looking well. Part of my problem, and I've talked to you all this before, I started here at Kentucky State University in 2005. It's hard for me to believe that that's 16 years ago myself, okay? But one of the things I did is I, when I started, I said we have to do some selection on production, some selection for health. So we started selecting animals for performance as well as parasite control, and we've added more and more parasite selection. Right now, if we selectively deworm a goat on our farm twice in a year, she gets a ride to town. My problem is my goats don't get heavily infected with parasites. So when I start looking to see if there's an impact in these rotational systems for parasite control, my parasite infection rate is low. I'm not willing to go out there and buy a bunch of new goats that have high infection rates to come in to test that, okay? I hope you all understand. I fought that battle. I'm winning that battle. I don't want to go backwards in that battle, okay? So we know the, we know the physiology, we know the practicality of it. The thing is, I'm not getting a good measurement of it because my animals are not getting the levels of infection that we need to really show a difference. And then you add into that the fact that, well, we're moving the, the slowest rotation is still 14 days they're not reinfecting off of that pasture, am I really gonna see a difference? I will say one thing we did with this iteration that we didn't do when we did this with the continuous versus seven day is we decided that the goats would not set foot on the same piece of ground until they came back to it for the next rotation. In the first study, we, d we set it up with a permanent shelter and a permanent, permanent water location, okay? So they always use the same spot for water and the same spot for shade. These fields have no trees in them. So we did an alleyway to go to those areas. Well, one of my arguments when people tell me to keep animals grazing above a certain height is where's the height adjustment on that animal? Emily mentioned that, you know, you can't tell them don't eat that or eat that. You can't tell the animals to not graze that alleyway or around that water tank or the shade area. So we don't know how many bites in those areas where they're heavily grazing because they're using all the time it takes to eliminate the value of that rotation. So this time we had a portable shelter that we used that could be moved. It was a shade shelter. It was a frame. We based it off of the cattle shade shelter frame that UK has available, plans available. They just cut the height down because we didn't need it as tall as cattle did, okay? What that made for us is when we went to put that shelter, uh, that shade cloth on the top, instead of me reaching up like this or having it, it was right here. So they, the people that work for me that aren't my height or McKinley's height didn't have to climb on the back of a gator to put that top on, okay? So it came down low enough to where you could do it better. But it's on skid so it can be drug around the pasture. It's two inch square tubing, so it's very sturdy, okay? The other thing we did is, and this came from the uh, grazing schools that are taught uh, with the Kentucky Forch and Grassland Council and uh, the Kentucky Extension Forage Program, when they teach the grazing programs, they talk about how to get water to these animals. And uh, when we go outside, McKinley will actually show you some of the parts of the setup. They take irrigation header hose, black header pipe, put a connector in it, and put a, a valve on the end of that connector. And so you can move your water down around through your system with this black header pipe without having to haul water or move water as long as you have a steady water source. 
Now, of course, you're going to have to drain it or it can freeze in the winter. It is plastic pipe. It's heavy-duty plastic pipe. It gets covered up by grass, so it doesn't get as hot as you think it will. You know, we, we have used some other irrigation pipe for this as well. The problem with the regular uh, aluminum irrigation pipe is that, just like anything else, the seals where it connects and all this, this header hose seemed to work a lot easier for us, and so we've kind of converted to that. Plus, it's flexible. If we need to, we can move it, drag it around the field some, okay? So we prevented those animals from coming up and actually grazing that same spot all the time. So we're seeing this, and this is what's kind of going there. The other interesting thing we have with this project is we are using UK Forge Extension. They're working with us, and they're coming, and they're doing some transects in these fields to look at what plants do we have growing in these pastures. One of the advantages that we hear about with rotational grazing, especially more intensive rotational grazing, is we increase the biodiversity of our pasture. And by increasing that biodiversity, one thing with the endophyte infected fescue, we start to dilute it out. Another thing is different types of plants have different rooting depths. So whenever we get into more drought type situations, plants with deeper roots are not impacted as, as heavily. Uh, we also know that legumes help to fix nitrogen so we don't have to fertilize our pastures to improve our productivity. And we have been seeing some differences between the rotations with the more intensive rotations not having as much of a increase in fescue. We're seeing more Kentucky, excuse me, in Kentucky bluegrass. We're seeing more orchard grass. So these are all, again, cool season grasses. I've done just some quick looks. I have not done a full statistical analysis on this, but we are seeing these differences, and it seems to be benefited by the more intensive grazing. And we think what's going on here is because the goats, sheep, or cattle will selectively not graze into fight infected fescue, okay, when we're giving them longer periods of time, they are better at selecting the bluegrass, the orchard grass, and these warm season grasses, which allows the fescue to then take over. In the more intensive grazing, they're forced to eat whatever's there, they're not as selective, and then we move and we're giving those other grasses more of a chance to then recover so they're able to compete a little bit better with the fescue in those cases. So. Uh, it's going to be good to get the last year worth of data on that so that we can actually go through and do some statistical analysis to see where we're at with that, see what really is, and if it's continuous, if the benefit we're seeing at the end of the season, what season one is still visible at the beginning of season two, season two to season three, see what that is, and see if it's, you know, make sure that it's not just a seasonal deal, that it's it's showing a a more permanent trend. Uh, but like I said, we have to get this last year worth of data, everything in, and, and get some time to run some analysis on that. On the selection for reproduction, uh, we're, what we're doing is we are a member, and the, the herd here does do a lot of data collection. As y'all know, I'm a big fan of data collection. We are members of NSIP, which is the National Sheep Improvement Program. They calculate breeding values for sheep and goats. And what I've been told by them for the number of years is they're more than happy to add goats to the name if they get more goat herds involved, because right now there's less than five goat herds submitting data. So why would they add goat to the name, okay? But one of the values that they calculate is a number of kids weaned value. So I get an estimate, once we submit the data, I have an estimate of the number of kids the does are expected to wean on average in, per year in their lifetime before they've had a kid born. So the goal there is can I eliminate singles, those that are more likely to have singles before I keep them around for a year or two and we get births. And we are seeing a correlation between number of kids weaned by the does and that breeding value. So we are seeing that. Now the flip side of this, which the people that work for me out here will tell you is, 
as we're selecting for more fertility, we're starting to see more triplets as well, a few more quads as well. The reality is, as we start working this, we can also start avoiding those real high number of kid weans to start bringing that back in and do a little bit better job of selecting for that twin without as many singles, without as many extra births. And I've talked to people about this before, and I've had people say, well, why don't you like triplets? It's like, well, my goat's udders, I want them to be nice udders, clean udders, two teats. That means there's two spots at the breakfast bar. And if you've got three mouths to feed, if you get extra teats in there, sometimes they're blind, sometimes they cause other issues. I know people say, well, I've got goats who are perfectly fine with four. It's like, congratulations, good job. Our triplets, we always seem to have at least one animal in our set of triplets that is not doing as well as the others. And I don't think we do as good of a job of doing that. So then whenever I do sell those animals, it tends to be a lighter animal down the road, okay? So we are seeing that that does seem to have an effect and is doing a good job for us, okay? What we're seeing, we've got a set of different dewormers. We're looking at individual dewormers, a control and a, a cocktail combination that includes uh, copper oxide wire particles as well as the chemical dewormers. We know from research done in sheep that at parturition, fecal egg counts go up. And it's believed that because Hamacus has evolved over centuries with the animals, that its consumption of the blood is picking up the hormone signal and is putting more eggs out there in order to infect the next generation of offspring. So if we can knock that down before they go out to pasture effectively, we can help reduce the exposure of these kids or lambs until their immune system is strong enough to help fight off that initial infection. So we've been looking at these cocktails, looking at uh, a couple of these cocktails that were recommended to us as well as the straight treatments. We are seeing a little bit of difference. Uh, of course, remember some of this stuff plays on what dewormers are effective in your herd and which ones aren't. If we see an impact by say, Cydectin, and Cydectin, your, the goat, the parasites in your herd are resistant to Cydectin, you're not gonna see that same impact, okay? We've got a couple of years worth of data on this. We are seeing a little bit of a trend. In my next project, we will probably have a more specific target of that using that data as a uh, model to say this is why we're wanting to look at it. The other thing we're hoping to do is use our preliminary data from the last couple of years to say, well, there's no use continuing to try this one or this one. So we can eliminate it so we don't have four to six treatments that we have to run, so that gives us more animals per year, so it helps us get a better reading of what's really going on out there, okay? The uh, last thing I wanna say is, one of the things we're gonna add this year, uh, this next iteration, and this is something I know this group, for the most part, your sheep and goat producers, we know that co-grazing is something that can work. Grazing multiple species together. And cattle and goats or cattle and sheep works well. Sheep and goats have the same parasite issues. They have some of the same desirable plants, so they're not as compatible, but again, you can do some things. But cattle are not affected by Hamacus contortus, except for very young ages. So they're immune, so the worms that they pick up worms, they don't get infected, they're not putting eggs out. We've known this for a long time, many, several decades. We also know that one of the problems with a lot of cattle pastures are weeds, okay? And I hate using the term weed because the correct definition of a weed is a plant out of place. So if it's something that my goats will eat, it's not a weed, it's forage, right? But if the cattle won't eat that blackberry bramble that's encroaching 
in a pasture, it's a weed in a cow pasture, but it's forage for a goat pasture. So we know that this is something that can work. But there's been a lot of work in this area, especially with sheep and cattle over the years. I was actually involved in a project like this when I was an undergraduate where they were grazing sheep and cows together. Not as much work's been done with, with goats, but we know that if you want the parasite control, you need to have a leader follower situation where the cattle are grazing after the eggs have had a chance to hatch and become infectious stage larvae. Otherwise, they're not going to vacuum up the parasite eggs, right? But we also know from some research that's out there that was conducted in this state down at uh, Quicksand that the, whoever grazes first is going to get the highest quality forage off of that. So if the goats go through first, they're going to take the best quality forage as well as the weeds. Then the cows are going to come through, and they're still going to have plenty of forage, but it's not going to necessarily be the best forage. Or if you run the cows through first, they're going to pick up that best, then the goats are going to get what's left. So what we've started to ask people when they ask about this, well, are you a goat farmer who wants to add cows, or are you a cattle farmer who wants to add goats? Because that's going to determine your leader follower. As long as I give you 14 days between the goats and the cows, we're going to pick up those larvae, okay? And I still need to have enough time for the grass to recover before the next one comes through, so there's some timing issues and planning that needs to go through this. So we're going to do some co-grazing. We've got the cow herd. We've got the goat herd. We're going to start doing some co-grazing projects in our next set of, of research projects, okay? I'm trying to focus as much as I can on some of these grazing issues because I really believe that that's a big part of what's going on. And I think that's a big part of what's going to improve your profitability is the better we manage our forage resources, the better we're going to be able to reduce our input costs, reduce our feed cost. But we have to be able to do it while maintaining the productivity of those animals, maintaining the growth rate of those animals and producing what the market wants. So what I find here is that endophyte infected fescue grows. And there's one thing that I know for sure is, it doesn't matter how good or bad the forage is, if it's not out there, it doesn't do you any good, okay? If the animals graze it out in a season and it costs a lot to establish, it's not going to be profitable for you. So we have to have ways of doing forage. They've done a lot of work with fescue and cattle, not as much in sheep and very, very little in goats. So, you know, we're trying to get to where we can do some of this to help you answer some of those questions. I realize that's just a short update. I don't, like I said, I apologize for not having some, some more analysis done. I sat down about five times over the past couple of weeks to start this analysis began to get my data set straight, then got a phone call, I had to go do something else. And so I apologize for it, it's just, I really wish that I had a lot of this up there for you. Okay, so with that, that kind of covers what I want to cover. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question was, if we have our goats on there for 14 days max and pull them off related to the parasite issue, the reality is, like I said, it's going to be 60 to 90 days, depending somewhat on weather conditions, moisture, heat, before you see a reduction in the uh, parasite load on pasture based on the research I've seen coming out of Louisiana and Georgia, okay? So if you want to continue to avoid that parasite load, you're going to need to wait that 60 days. My problem is a lot of times our forage is getting too mature. So that's where I think if we keep it down to that lower, that 60 day, we'll get enough benefit with our forage height that then we can, again, still reduce some of that issue with the parasites. But I still say our best thing, we need to do all of these management deals to help us reduce parasite load. 
But the number one thing we're going to do to be to beat parasite problems in the long term is selective deworming, data collection, and culling the animals that have issues. When I started here in 2005, it was not unusual for us to be deworming our, our does uh, at least every other month based on need, okay? Today, like I said, if we deworm her twice based on FAMACHA score, she's gone. And Emily's been taking care of this for me for the last year or so, but the last several years that I actually was doing it, we probably had less than, probably weren't having two animals a year being culled based on, on parasite infections, okay? So when I say we've done a, I won't say it's all due to genetics, it's due to management, due to genetics, it's a combination of everything, okay? But the thing is, if I take one of those out, then I'm not gonna be as effective. So do your management to avoid it, do your pr programming, do your selection. And like I said, what I see a lot of people do is they're wanting to do the, the grazing and some of the avoidance, but they don't want to do any of the, the selection to help in data collection that's needed to do that selection. And I will say this, it takes the data collection, but NSIP also offers a fecal egg count EBV or breeding value for goats. My problem is it just takes a long time to get enough data to make that useful longer than some of the others. And you do, and, the, and Emily doesn't like me for this twice a year because uh, we have to collect fecal samples on every kid that's born, and they have to run those fecal samples to get the fecal egg counts in order to report that data. So when, you, when I'm asking her to do 120 fecal egg counts twice in a year, uh, and she has just a couple of days to do them in, that's part of when I say she doesn't like me for that, it's, that's, it's a lot of work, okay, just to get that data. But how else am I going to know the infection level of that animal to be able to start selecting for it, okay? Any other questions? Yes, um, we have a question from Zoom. It says, have there been any studies done using bioworma or larva more in the rotational grazing and active larva? Okay, the question on the bioworma or the, the larval, I forget the other brand name for the product. For those of you who haven't read about these, this is a fungal treatment that binds to the larva and kills the larva. There has been research on these. The problem is that in order for it to be effective, you have to have that animal consuming the product every day. Okay, so you're gonna to have to supplement that animal every day. They're talking about getting it in some minerals. They're talking about all this. The problem is making sure that the dose is correct if you're not feeding feed, okay? There, it is effective in reducing parasite loads. It's, okay, and that's what it's doing. It's, it's keeping the larva from being able to reinfect the animal. The problem has been cost and the requirement that they have to be fed every day. The advantage of this is if you are one of those producers that every treatment that you have, every one of the possible treatments out there is not working on your place, this is something that you can do, okay? But like I said, there are research projects out there looking at it, whether you're doing rotational or continuous grazing, it doesn't matter, it's effective. It's just you have to feed it to that animal daily. That animal has to get a daily dose of it, okay? Any other questions? If not, our next speaker is Dr. Jessie Lay. She is a, our extension veterinarian here. She's going to talk some on health of the dam. We know that most of you are either in or, or ending your breeding season, and kidding and lamb is going to be coming up here for people starting in the next month or two, depending on whether you're kidding for 4-H or or other projects depends on your timing. So we're, I'm going to turn it over to Jesse and let her talk about dam health. All right, thanks, Kim, for letting me come up here and talk today. 
Um, it's great seeing you guys in person again. Um, you have no idea how awkward it is doing a webinar and telling your computer a joke and no one's laughing. So um, it's great to see everybody's smiling faces. So today I want to talk a little bit about the health of the dam, right? So when you're kidding, when you're lambing, these things come out, they're tiny, right? A lot of times they're weak and we're doing everything to keep these kids alive or lambs. But a lot of times we forget about mama. All right. Okay, so there's several things here. Um, there's a whole lot of factors. I wish there was like one or two things I could say, do this, all your breeding animals are gonna be stay healthy. It's not that easy, right? There's so many things that go into it. The biggest thing that you can do for disease prevention is proper nutrition, right? But then you've also gotta think about environmental factors, right? Biosecurity of your herd. A per but at the end of the day, production depends on reproduction, right? So these animals are not gonna be profitable if they're not being fertile. So longevity. So some of these, you know, dairy goats are gonna be able to be bred at a year old, right? I usually say 80 pounds. And for a lot of the dairy goats, they can do that. Um, but some of the slower growing animals, of course, they're not kidding or lambing for the first time until they're two years old. So you fed them for two years, which is an investment, right? So that investment is in that animal continuing to go through breeding cycles. So if you breed her one year and then you have to cull her, right? you've got the same amount of money in that one animal as you do in another animal who makes it through like six breeding seasons. So do you see how that investment of those, that first year, that first two years of taking care of that replacement animal, right, is going to be affected by how many kids or lambs she has in her lifetime. The more she can have in a lifetime, is making up for that cost of the first year, right? Um, so, next slide. All right. So, in repro in vet school, I had Dr. Carson. Dr. Carson was an uh, amazingly smart man, right? He is a legend. Um, took from us way too soon. But the first day of repro, he walked in and he told the class. Right? Sex is a luxury. The body will take care of what it needs before it takes care of what it wants. Right? It's an easy concept. Right? You get your paycheck. What do you do first? All right, you got to pay the rent, gotta pay your car insurance, right? pay the bills. And then the money left over, you get to go play. Right? So that's all we're saying. So there's a lot of stress with metabolic changes, right? Um, go back. Okay, it doesn't have the... So basically, what goes into metabolism? Well, first of all, there's maintenance, right? So maintenance is the calories that an animal needs to keep the heart beating, the lungs expanding, walking around. And it's not much. When we start talking about a dry, not lactating, not pregnant goat or sheep, they're usually fine on pasture. Their nutritional requirements fairly low. But as we start adding on different stages of life, right, that nutritional requirement goes up. 
right? So first is growth, right? Growing kids often need supplementation of protein. I actually went to a conference last week that was showing some research that's being done on just increasing the protein levels in an animal's diet as a preventative for parasites with no other chemicals, just the protein level. But now protein is the expensive part of our rations. So they're still doing some further research on that and I'll uh, keep you updated, All right? So the next thing is reproduction, right? Gestation and lactation, right? And then you've got to subtract from the losses. There it is, there's my formula. So that formula is the easiest way to remember this. We have maintenance plus growth plus gestation or lactation, and then you subtract account for your losses, right? The losses can be from parasites, or they can be the thermal losses of keeping themselves warm in the wintertime or cool in the summertime, right? So let's think about the first breeding cycle. A lot of the times the animal is still young and still growing herself, right? So then we take on board, you know, the fetuses. Those are going to increase the nutritional need. And then lactation, right? Then they get four months off and we ask them to breed back. Even if they have five-star accommodations, just the stress of the metabolism changing that quickly multiple times a year is a lot on these girls. And then we have challenges with intake, right? So what is the maximum intake of a goat, right? What is the most it can eat? Well, as you've heard by most of our previous speakers, it depends. And it really does. There's so much of a variation, right? So think about sheep or goat that's pregnant with quads. She's going to need a lot of calories, right? But where's she going to put it? When she eats, there's nowhere for it to go. Those babies are taking up so much space in her belly, right, that she physically can't eat enough. But now what if she has a single? She's going to be able to eat probably more than she needs. Right. All right, and don't forget about the minerals as we start talking about malnutrition, right? If I say something is malnutrition, the first thing you think of something that's super skinny, right? That's not true. I've seen lots of goats that were fat and sassy and didn't have enough copper, right? So I put this picture in here. Um, it's not the best picture in the world, but it just shows the difference in noses of some of our livestock. If you look at sheep and goats, they have that little split in their lip, right? They cannot eat mineral blocks. So anytime that you're putting out mineral for sheep and goats, it needs to be the loose mineral. If you look at a cow with that big square nose, they can eat those blocks, but the sheep and goats can't. All right, so in gestation, the first, in second trimester, there's really very, very little increase in their needs, right? At that point, one cell is becoming two cells and then two cells is becoming four cells. But in the third trimester, right, this is where we start seeing these rapid increases. So in this picture, this is actually a mummified fetus that had died mid-gestation. So going into that last month of gestation, Look at the size difference. Said so that small fetus had died midway through gestation and just sat there not growing until she went into labor, right? So they go from that small to a full-size fetus in like a month, right? So that's a short amount of time when there's, those kids are doing a lot of growing, right? Um, it's really best if we can separate them because if you've got three or four kids in there that are growing rapidly, she's going to need a lot of extra calories. 
but we can overdo it. Here's the problem. Has anyone heard of fetal programming? You guys not heard of that term yet? So what they are now finding, the current research says that the growth rate of an animal and an animal's metabolism is actually programmed while it's still in utero. So if you have a doe or a ewe that is too thin and not getting enough feed while she's pregnant, her offspring will never be able to catch up with those of a properly fed female. But it goes the other way too. If a ewe is overfed while she's pregnant, her offspring will still have a decreased growth rate. So we want them to be somewhere between a two and a half and a three and a half before breeding. I prefer a three to three and a half. But if you start getting these girls at body condition scores of four, you can actually go the other way and start having a lot more problems as well. All right. So I pulled this, this slide is actually about a cow came from one of my um, repro lectures. But just to stress the nutritional demand of lactation, I always throw this one up there to my class, right? So a good dairy cow will give 100 pounds of milk a day, right? If you look at the, comp or the composition of milk, if it's 5% sugar, right? Think about how many calories are in a five pound bag of sugar. That's a lot, right? If milk is three and a half, four percent um, fat, right? Think about the fat around the edge of a steak. How much is three pounds of fat, right? So lactation is going to be the highest nutritional demand. Right. So I want to talk about a couple diseases here going into um, lambing kidding season. So pregnancy toxemia, all right, so this is that last trimester, right? I showed you the picture of how they were going from about the size of a rat to, you know, a full-grown fetus in just a matter of weeks, right? So they're rapidly growing, right? She went from a nutritional demand that was just a little increase over maintenance, right? Until it exponentially is growing. At the same time, all the bones in those fetuses are going from cartilage to the hard bones that we think of, all right? So hypocalcemia and pregnancy toxemia, they can have one without the other, um, but a lot of times they're seen in combination. So at the same time, if a you or a doe is a body condition score four before you breed them, right? They're not just fat on the outside, they're fat on the inside too. Their metabolism is set very slowly because they've had all the calories they needed. And then suddenly they're in a negative energy balance which means that their body is needing more calories than they can physically consume. And if you add into that, that they have triplets or quads, right? Those, a higher need for calories because there are multiple fetuses growing and they're also limiting the intake. Like I said, that belly full of babies. Even if you put food in front of her all day, there's only so much physical space that she can intake. Right. So what are the cl clinical signs of pregnancy toxemia? Right, we start seeing swollen extremities. Um, these girls will have a normal body temperature. So anytime that you have a sheep or goat that's acting off, always take their temperature, right? Because this is going to really let us know metabolic changes Right? Those aren't affected by the immune system. There's no inflammatory reaction. So if it's parasites or some kind of metabolic problem, a lot of times you won't see a fever. Now if there is an infectious agent like pneumonia, 
right, or some kind of bacterial infection, those usually don't do come with a fever, right? And treatment, um, you start drenching her with propylene glycol, which in their digestive system turns into straight energy, right? Offer them high quality forage sources as well as grain sources, right? Because she can't take in that much and her demand is really high. And then the last thing is induction of labor, right? That's easy if you know the breeding date, but most of the time we don't. Like I said, for our commercial operations, um, if they've just been bred naturally in a field, a lot of times you don't know exactly when that was. But if we think about the physiology of this, like I said, it's caused because she is putting out more energy than she is taking in, right? So by inducing labor, we separate her from the problem, right? You know, kind of think about it as like parasites, right? So a parasite is an organism that lives in or on another species and benefits by deriving nutrients at the other's expense, right? So you've heard a thousand parasite lectures, and I'm not going to go into that right now. But as we start talking about these offspring, we start talking about these breeding animals. They won't let me call them parasites because technically they're not another species, but they are still, right, deriving the mother from nutrients, right, when she's lactating, when she's gestating. She is, they are taking nutrients from her. Body condition scoring. This is super important, right? Always look at the FAMANCHA and the body condition score together, right? But then we're also going to think about all of these metabolic factors, right? Because <laughs> I drive Emily crazy because she'll ask me questions and I'll say, well, it depends, okay? So um, I know it's after lunch, everybody's kind of sleepy. But if you have an animal that's coming out of lactation and she is about, to, you're about to wean the kids off of her, let's say she's a body condition score of two and her famancha is a three. Do you treat her or not treat her? But would you? Because you're getting ready, I said that lactation was the most stressful event, the most stressful stage of production, right? So she's been stressed, but you're getting ready to take the stress away from her when you wean those kids. And if she's a three on her FAMANCHA score, you can probably wait and see what happens because her life is about to get a whole lot easier, right? All right, same scenario. You're going into breeding season, right? She's a three on FAMANCHA, but her body condition score, two, two and a half. Do you deworm her? Right, now at that point I would, right? But we gotta think ahead. When we're looking at the FAMANCHA scores and the body condition scores, it's a snapshot, right? It's one day. Right, But we know what's coming. So if we're getting ready to breed an animal and she's already a little too skinny and her parasite level is marginal, right? let's go ahead and treat her because we know we're getting ready to put a whole lot of physiological stress on her. Right? Not to mention that going into breeding season, there are a lot of dewormers we can't give to pregnant animals. So if she is more pale next month, we might be out of luck and not able to treat her. Right. So stress in the immune system. So that's my point. I got a little ahead of myself. But stress of the biologic processes. Like I said, even if she lives in the ivory tower, right? just those metabolic changes of being bred every year it's going to be a lot of stress on her system, right? So we also want to look at the environmental conditions, 
right? Parasite loads. So I think Dr. Andrews did a great job of talking about how moving them from one field to another, right, is addressing the load of parasites on the pasture. Right? Sanitation of your kidding pens. Like I said, we're bringing them in. They're stressed. They're getting ready to go through this problem process. Going into lactation. Now, I never had children myself because usually when the vet's involved, it doesn't look fun. Um, also, barn cats, you want to give them a clean feed source, right? And then biosecurity. When I talk about your herd being clean or your barn being clean, you know, you obviously start thinking about mud or bacteria counts, feces, but keeping your herd clean from other animals that could be asymptomatic carriers. All right, so vaccines, we have all heard way more than we've ever wanted to know about vaccines in the past few months. Um, but if we can prevent a disease, let's do it. There are gonna be so many conditions that we can't prevent. Um, if there is, is a vaccine for it, let's go ahead and make sure that we at least prevent what we can. All right. Abortions, um, stress, nutrition, right? are going to add to any of the infectious causes. There are multiple causes of abortions in sheep and goats, and most of these are contagious. So if you have a, you or a doe that's having any stillborns, right, or she's aborting, make sure if there are any pregnant women, they don't touch the fluids, right? and some of these fluids can even be aerosolized. So um, looking at a fetus, you can't tell which one of these pathogens. Sometimes you can, especially with cash value, you can get some really weird birth defects, but um, take the fetus and the placenta to the diagnostic lab. The diagnostic lab can usually get more information from the placenta of a stillborn than they can the actual carcass. So mastitis and metritis, these are conformational um, pictures. You said the fish teats um, and the bottle teats. On these, it would be almost impossible for a kid to nurse. You said in this one, you see the two openings so when kids come out, they're not really that smart. How can they figure out how to drink out of that? On this one, look how close her teat is to the ground, right? So when these kids come out, how is it gonna be smart enough to get that low, to get that in its mouth to nurse? So it's gonna be a problem with the kids, but also if it's not nursing out of that teat, and if that teat is exposed to the ground, being that low, being stepped on, right, that's going to be an issue where she gets cold. And udders, udder conformation is genetic, right? So it's not only her. If she has daughters, you want to make sure that you've checked them really close because most likely they're going to have some udder problems too. All right. Okay, so listeria. Listeria is a bacteria, right? So it's naturally in the environment. It's everywhere. But it's in decaying plant materials, right? So that bale of hay, I don't know if you can really tell, but it's really moldy, really rotten. So we automatically think about, okay, well, there's decaying vegetation. But it can also be found in grain troughs, right? Because when they eat, they eat most of it, but there's always that powder left. And if that powder gets wet, if your troughs are outdoors, they need to be cleaned on a regular basis. Right? As we're going through these breeding cycles, like I said, she's going through the physiological stress. Like I said, keeping the environment as clean as possible um, is going to be the best way you can prevent diseases. All right? Polio encephalomalacia. Um, fancy term for uh, 
vitamin B1 deficiency, thiamine deficiency. It causes neurologic problems. Usually, initially, they go blind. You'll see them in a field that looks like they're stargazing, right, just looking off into space. And then as it progresses, they go down, and there is actual deterioration of the brain. Um, and death can occur within 24 hours. All right. So a normal, healthy rumen makes all the B vitamins the animal needs. They don't need to be fed B vitamins. But if you have a rumen that's unhealthy, right, any kind of digestive upset, right, you're going to have to supplement, and in young kids as well. But um, so keeping them, avoid any kind of drastic changes. Now I told you their metabolism's changing, and I told you that you're going to have to change their feed, that when they're in the dry period, they don't need supplementation, but when they're lactating, they do, right? But we need to make those changes gradual, with the one exception of weaning, um, which I'll get into in just a few minutes. All right. So CAE and OPP. Um, how many people test their herd for CAE? Anybody? All right. So hopefully you never bring it in, but it is a disease that um, can cause just absolute train wrecks. It can cause mastitis, it can cause encephalitis or brain infections, or arthritis, right? But it's one of those that, you know, when you start seeing it, you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg because it has such a long incubation period, right? So if you're bringing any animals into your goat herd, I recommend testing for CAE because once you have it, like I said, you can have, you know, half of your herd carrying it and run into some really, really big problems. All right. So hoof care, right? I always like to put up this picture when I start talking about hoofs, right? A flat tire on a lawnmower, how much grass is it gonna mow, right? So if you have a lameness issue, they have to walk around to eat. Grazing requires walking. So if you start having a lot of hoof problems, they're gonna lose weight really, really quickly, right? Hoof rot or foot rot can be contagious, especially in sheep. Um, this is a sheep's foot, and the bacteria has actually eaten through the soles. It's a really, really nasty case I saw, right? But um, don't want to keep you here all afternoon, but basically just as a summary, um, keeping breeding animals will increase their longevity, and then at the end of the day, that's increasing your profitability, right? Breeding stock go through a lot of metabolic changes, and it's important to keep up with these and to think, ahe think ahead when you're feeding them. Minimizing the stress and providing that optimal nutrition and the minerals will maximize the function of the immune system, right? And then minimizing the exposure to pathogens, right? You wanna monitor these girls closely, right? So, um, you know, Emily's talking about doing all these grazing projects or browsing projects and how you can take them and put them, you know, in all these different locations. But when, especially when they start getting to that peripartum time, you don't want to take these heavy bred females and put them where you can't keep an eye on them. So I'll be around this afternoon for a little bit. Um, every herd's going to be a little bit different, whatever your pr production system is. Um, you're going to have a little bit different concerns. Um, but if you ever do have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Yes. You uh, diagnostic lab. Mm -hmm. So University of Kentucky has one in Lexington. It's over um, off of Georgetown Road or Citation, kind of right there in that area. 
Um, it's Bull Lee Road, um, but I can get you the directions. There's also Breathitt um, in Western Kentucky, Breathitt Diagnostic Lab. Um, I can get you the number and location for that. Um, which area of the state are you in? UK, right. So, so yeah, so they have, I can get you their website and their information, but when you start talking about the abortions, like I said, there's five or six different causes that look identical as far as symptoms go. But once we, you take one to the lab, if they can get you the individual cause, we can work backwards from there and figure out, right, what we need to do to prevent it. Yes. Notes as quickly as I could, but you mentioned flushing. How many days out would you say before uh, a U is it term to increase her nutrient load to the max in her last days of pregnancy? Okay, so that last period of pregnancy. Okay, so the last, going into the last trimester or when she kids. Right. So, and it's kind of weird because in all other species, we talk about trimesters because they're usually like nine months. So there's that easy last three months. When they're pregnant five months, it, it kind of throws the trimester thing out. We got to, you know, you got to start carrying a one and it's, okay. So, um, I usually say the, the last, yeah, the last month, um, of gestation and it's going to depend because you can overdo it. If she's got a single, she may not need a whole lot of extra feed. But what I suggest is doing ultrasounds. Equipment and if it's reasonably priced, can you get grants for it? Yada, yada. Right, if you can get an ultrasound and you can figure out which ones are carrying triplets and which ones are carrying singles, okay, then you put the ones with singles in this pen and then the ones with quads and triplets in this pen and you can feed them different and everybody's happy. That doesn't work for every management system, right? Because I, I have a lot of people, I tell them that, and they're like, really? So I gotta have two different pens for you know, each group? It does add to the labor. But like I said, the fetal programming, it is really, really interesting. I've been watching the research come through, and like I said, so it's just like you program a computer while that fetus is in utero its metabolism for its entire life is being set, right? So it's really, really interesting. Yeah. You mentioned that propylene glycol. Yes. Can you say more about how to use that and when to use that? So propylene glycol, so you know, the traditional antifreeze is ethylene glycol. So propylene glycol is, you know, kind of a really close to it. Don't give them ethylene. It's only the propylene. Most feed stores will have it. Um, if they don't, vet, vet clinics will. I give them like 60 cc's, which that's a lot to drench them with. Um, but I start drenching them with that twice a day, right? So twice a day, drench them with 60 cc's or 60 milliliters. And what happens is when they digest it, it turns into glucose right? And it's an energy source for them, right? Because that's, you know, what's happening is the energy balance. Right? Those kids are growing so fast that they're not able to keep up with their intake. Do you do that? Only if they're showing symptoms of pregnancy toxemia. And for that will be the swollen joints. They'll be off feed. They won't want to eat. They'll be lethargic. Now, if they start getting hypocalcemia with it as well, um, muscles need calcium to contract. So when their calcium levels bottom out, right, then at that point, they're usually down and they're unable to stand, right? So the classic picture will be this, you know, big fat doe or you, right? She was doing fine. You know, and she's huge. You think she's going to lamb any day. And then you go out there one day and she's down. She can barely stand up. And you're like, what happened? Well, what happened was all those metabolic problems. 
those babies were taking up so much space and growing so quickly, she physically could not eat enough, right? Because there was nowhere to put it, right? So at that point, you know, I, earlier I talked about, you know, how when you get your paycheck, you know, you pay your bills first, and then, you know, you go spend money on what you want. Well, she had plenty of calories. She was big and fat, right? So she was extra fertile. Right? And then when she has those multiples, right, all of a sudden, okay, I didn't have as much money left over as I thought I did, right, because they start taking a whole lot more from her. Does that make sense? Yes. This, this is going to be a, a rough guesstimate, I guess, in your case. But um, the percentage of a lactating female versus a pregnant female, what percentage of calories does that lactating female need um, versus when she was pregnant? Is there a, an increase of what percent of her nutritional needs in terms of calories, but also in terms of uh, minerals, in terms of other things? And is there a book where I can find that information if it's not something on the tips of your finger? There is. There is a website that has, there's a website where you can look up, you can, it has like all these tables and you can put like the type of animal, like its age, its reproductive status, and it's gonna tell you exactly how much it needs. Um, it's the, it's the, the NR, sheep, so it's, um, I'll get it for you, but it's actually the, um, Research Council, but I, I'll get the website for you. Um, I don't have it in here, but um, but yeah, so you can get that. But it's going, like I said, it's going to vary, um, and there's not. So, like I said, early in gestation, there's you really don't have to worry about feeding them anything extra. Like I said, that early lactation, the first three months, they're not having any large demands. Now, getting towards that last gestation, the last of gestation. Now, if they have a single, a little bit more feed, you know, an extra handful or two, but nothing dramatic if they have a single. Now, if they start having triplets or quads, right, their nutritional requirements can almost double, right? And now that's with, you know, quads or going into lactation, that's going to be, you know, you when they're going to need the absolute most increase. But are we talking about a dairy animal that's got a huge udder versus a meat animal, right? And you'll be able to tell. And then also, you know, when they're lactating, you are looking at the growth of the kids, right? Because how well the kids are growing is going to be one of the best indications of how your you of how your you is producing. Right, and she's. If you see, notice her losing r weight rapidly while she's lactating, then you know just up the feet a little bit because she may need it. Right. Yes. Off topic, all, but the goats. I've got some of them that have underneath their tail, it's almost black, and others are it's pink. What is that hereditary? That some of them are like that. Like the skin on the bottom side? Yeah, on, right under the tail. Um, so that's their just... Their feet will be the same way. Yeah, that's, the, that's just the pigment of their skin. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned uh, ultrasound for numbers, and you talked about a few things. Can you mention a little bit, especially I know the UK Diagnostic Lab really wants animals coming through the vets, not necessarily having a tie to a veterinarian, at least you can drop it off yourself. Can you talk a little bit about uh, doing ultrasounds, who should be doing that, getting some of this so that you get good accurate information? I know I've done some of it and it's not as easy as some people think it is to, to get some of this stuff. Okay, so I. Usually, I don't like to ultrasound them earlier than 35 days. Um, 30, so you want to wait till they, the last you, until 35 days after you remove the male, right? So the last possible days she could have got bred, 
go out 35 days from that. Now some of them will be a little bit further along. So it's best to look somewhere between that 30 to 60 day range is when I can see the best of multiple fetuses. But it's not invasive, right? So in cattle, you know, they go in rectally, right, with the probe. In sheep and goats, you don't have to do that, right? You just go in the flank. You'll go like right up under their leg with the probe and you'll be able to see the fetuses or the placentomes, the placenta, right? But if you do them early enough, you can actually count the number of fetuses, right? So as long as they're not too far along, once they get too far along, you really can't see it. Um, I suggest having your vet do it, but if you guys have a lot of sheep or goats, you can get some ultrasounds that are actually not that expensive, right? And um, we could even do some kind of workshop where we invited you here and kind of showed you how to do it, right? So we could, we could probably set something up like that, couldn't we, Ken? All right? But technically, technically, diagnosing pregnancy is diagnosing an animal with something. So, you know, it really shouldn't go out and get trained ultrasound if you're not a veterinarian and start doing it as a business. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing it on your own animals, right? But if you can identify, like do those ultrasounds and you can tell which one of those ewes has the three or four and which ones have the singles, right? That is tremendously gonna be able to help how you manage these girls. One thing I would add to that is I know it's not advertised as much anymore, but we're not talking about the preg tone systems. We're talking about a real-time ultrasound to do this. Right. So the, the preg tones will just give you an idea, is it pregnant or is it not? You have to have a real-time ultrasound to get the image in order to count the fetuses. So that's also gets into some of the cost. I know there's some cheaper ones than the ones that, that we have, but just so people understand, because I've heard some people talk about ultrasounding their animals for pregnancy, and you talk to them a little bit more, and they've got a preg tone that they're, they're doing ultrasound. And yes, it uses ultrasound, but that's all it's going to do is say pregnant open. If right. You, you want the actual ultrasound, not just the machines. But you can actually find some cheap on eBay now. Like a lot of times when vets get new ones, right? They, and, Vets are cheap. They like to get all their money back, right? They'll put it on eBay, and you can get some really good deals there. You would cost 20000 Cheap is relative. Okay, cheap is relative. But um, they're, they are out there where you can purchase them. It, I mean, um, any kind of uh, worms or anything. I mean, we're, we're just, we're new to this. And I don't know what, what we need to do with our girls. Right, so um, have you taken the FAMANCHA training? Do you know what I'm talking about when I talk about that? Okay, all right, so that's, so that's great. So that's a quick crude method. You can also have fecals done, all right? But the FAMANCHA is going to be quick and easy. You can kind of look at their eyelids, right? And it's an estimate of parasite load. And it's often done in combination with the body condition score, right? And that's how, you know, how fat or how skinny. When we talk about the body condition score, it's a scale from one to five, right? So three is right in the middle, right? We don't want these girls too fat, but we don't want them too thin. So what I tried to get through, you know, talking through the different stages and the metabolism, and I know it really gets hectic, but just looking ahead, right? So if you're getting ready to breed an animal and she's kind of iffy, go ahead and treat her, right? But like I said, if she's been stressed and you're getting ready, you know, to take the kids, take the stress away from her, then you'll just check her next month. So as you're getting into it, once you learn how to do the FAMANCHA scoring and the body condition scores, I would do that on your herd like once a month, right? And that's a way to monitor it. And um, Ken, I think you were talking earlier about, you know, the cattle, right? So um, 
<laughs> with cattle, they've never had issues with parasite resistance before, right? That's not a big, big thing, right? They deworm cattle and it works and they're fine. So here lately, they've, they came out a couple years ago with a product called Long Range. And it's for cattle, not for sheep and goats. But it was gonna be this long acting product that lasted for like three months. It's a slow release, right? And they're like, so all the farmers start using it, right? They're like, oh, this dewormer lasts for three months. Well, it's a slow release, which means that animal is getting a little bit of dewormer every day for 90 days, right? And everyone was like, oh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, guess what? You dewormed an animal for 90 days in a row that didn't need it. So now, farms that have started using that product, they've changed the label. And they're saying if you got an animal that's going straight to slaughter, it's still a great product. But they've backed off and said if it's going to be a replacement animal you're going to keep, maybe you don't want to do that. Right? So in the upcoming years, if they don't start being a little bit more careful, they could end up with problems with resistance to dewormers and cattle as well. Yes. Um, I could talk about it. I'm, yeah. so, I'm the one with drug license, I'll take that. So, of course, every time we start talking about drugs, we're talking off-label, but yes, the cocktails are showing that they're having a lot of good results, right? So, so, um, so a cocktail dewormer is using multiple dewormers at once, right? We're having resistance to so many different dewormers that what they found is giving two separate classes of dewormers at a time, right? You're coming at the parasites from two completely different directions, right? And you're actually getting more effective results. Now, some of the studies I've seen show that the parasites may come back a little bit quicker, but as far as if one chemical, one class of dewormer, such as let's say cydectin, right? Let's say you're starting to get a little bit of resistance to it. It's only 70% effective in your herd, right? Well, then you can come back with one of the white dewormers, such as valbazin, and use them together, right? So that's what we call a cocktail. You know, we're mixing them. Not in the same syringe, but we're just giving them at the same time, right? And because each different drug has a different mechanism of action, right? It attacks something different on the parasite, right? So by using multiples at one time, what we're trying to do is kill that small percentage of worms that weren't killed by the other dewormer, right? Because what happens with the resistance issues is when we give a dewormer, let's say it kills 90%, of the animal's worms, homonchus usually, right? That 10% that it didn't kill was exposed to the dewormer. And next time you, and so that 10% of the worms are gonna start multiplying, right? So then the parasites that are in the system multiplying are the ones that didn't respond to the dewormer, right? So as that percentage keeps coming, right, those keep multiplying, right, you can end up with a lot of resistance issues if you keep using the same thing over and over again, right. Um, some of the best methods of deworming are the ones where we're not relying on chemicals, right, such as rotational grazing, browsing, 
right? So, you know, as Emily talked about, these browsing products are projects. They're eaten high up off the ground, right? The basic cycle of parasites, whether it be coccidia, tapeworms, or homonchus, right? The eggs live in the animal, or the adults live in the animal. They pass eggs through the feces, which goes to the ground. Another animal comes by and ingests it, right? It's fecal oral, right? Well, they're pooping on the ground. That's where the eggs are. So when we start looking at some of these browsing projects, they're not eaten off the ground, right? That was their kind of natural defense, right? We've tried to teach these goats to graze, and they will, um, but they do. They like climbing up on stuff and eating and browsing. Yes. Right. Um, so, right. Um, I do the, I do the uh, oral is usually what I use, the Cydectin oral drench. Right. Um, I haven't used the injectable on sheep and goats. Like I said, the oral drench is labeled for the sheep and goats. So if there is a labeled product, that's what we try to use. Um, like I said, now, now before the oral drench came out, yeah, we gave the pour on orally back in the day. Like I said, I did that a lot. But now they have the, uh, the drench that's actually labeled, and we know what the dose is, so that way we're not just guessing anymore. Right. When the Cydecta ingestible first came out, the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control made a recommendation of using it. Kind of like the long-range product, what they found is after a period of time, they realized that it was not clearing the animal qu as quickly. It was staying at sub-therapeutic levels in the animal for a longer period of time. So they actually stopped recommending using the injectable, okay? And I've not heard of anybody recommending the injectable since the drench came out. Now, like I said, I'm not the veterinarian, so I'm just, that's, yeah. what, that's what the vet people at them were, were putting out there. Yeah, and you, I mean, you've got to remember, you know, we're talking about two animal or cattle versus sheep and goats. Sheep and goats aren't little cows. Except for a long time, we tried to treat them like such, and they're not. You know, sheep and goats aren't cows, and sheep aren't goats, right? So we're talking about different species, different metabolisms, right? You know, how many times do you look out in the field and you see cows standing there with three inches of snow on her back? Well, she's got a leather jacket on, literally. Right? <laughs> a cow skin is going to be two or three inches thick. I mean, it is. Like when you skin a cow, like we do an in-crop, their skin is like this thick. You start talking about sheep and goats, it's much, much thinner. It's like this. Right? So that cow, yeah, she's standing there with three inches of snow on her back and she's acting fine. Well, at goats, they don't have a shelter. They get cold. They don't have that extra layer of protection. So getting back to the injectable. So in cows, yes, you inject it, and it goes into this big fatty, you know, fat underneath the skin. Well, you don't have that in the goats. Like their entire skin's made different, right? So how do we know how that's going to absorb? So yes, when you give it to the cows, it goes into the big, big chunk of fat, goes into their system, and it works fine. Well, the way that it moves through the system, right, is not the same because when you start injecting things into animals that have completely different anatomies, it's not going to work correctly. And what happens, as Ken was saying, is when you start exposing them to these drugs and these drugs don't work, you start building up resistance. I'm going to have to uh, cut this off to go to the next, get the next one started. Uh, Jesse, you will be around, so if anybody has yes. any further questions, you will be available. Yes. But uh, we want to be able to get to the next, next presentation, so we have time to do that. And especially since that one is outdoors, 
and the sun is now out. I do see the trees moving, so the wind is still blowing, but at least the sun's out. It doesn't look like it's about to rain again. So the next presentation will be uh, off the back here, just outside, okay?
So how are y'all doing today? Um, we're gonna start over here and then we'll go over to the table. Um, I'm gonna kind of show y'all, like she said, some of the tools that we use for our rotational grazing. I know that they talked about Goshen and West Six in there. Uh, we use netting out there. Uh, you can also use both. One's a lot more visual and they can see it. And then this one's just very portable and convenient. So uh, this is the Gallagher Smart Fence. I love it. Uh, all our fields over there are already have a perimeter wire on it. So all I have to do is stake it directly to it and then I can run it to the opposite side and it's completely uh, electric. Um, so with it, it's kind of like a fishing pole. You want to just loosen up your reel and then you can actually pull it out and then stake it in. They do have um, little stuff that you, you can use it as an anchor. I don't use it as an anchor. I don't, it doesn't work as well because it can pull out pretty easily. Uh, over there, I've got another way. There's different ways you can do it, but um, you can actually just just keep it loose and then pull it out oh, and come through and stake it. Um, it's super simple. Same way to reel it up. You just reel it up and then like a fish pole, just put it down. Um, one thing that's neat about it is they come with different loops. So if you want, you can cut the string and rerun it depending on how the height you want it or anything like that. If they're being ornery and they're wanting to jump through it and stuff, you can set it up and tie a wire directly to it and then run it back through in the open wire just to keep it more uh, closed off. Um, they do break. I've had them break on me before. Um, all you gotta do is tie the knot back together and you're good. Um, the best knot that I found is called a robber's knot. So for it to go through here, it's kind of has a little lever system inside of it and big knots, are, it'll, it'll give you a lot of trouble and make a headache. The one that I use is called a robber's knot and it'll go in and out. The worst thing you'll have to do is grab the spool which the line has the knot on and just pull it up like that and it'll go right through. Um, Majority of the time, I have great success with it. I'm not going to tell you you're going to set it up and your goats aren't going to get out. If they know what electric is, that's, you know, it's, it's better. If they don't know, they're going to test it. I've had them come up and nibble on it. That's one reason you want to always have it electrified. If uh, the electric's not running and they're playing with it, you, you can get it all tangled up and it can get into a mess. But with these, I like them a lot more than the netting because, like I said, you can just cut the knots or wherever it got tangled rerun the wire and you're good to go. Just set it back on the electric. Um, I'll show you some other stuff. On most of our uh, plots, we just run them in a straight line from end to end and then rotate them up. Um, you can make a square. Best thing to do with that is I've used T-posts. These are pins that we use just out of any of our stuff. Just stake them down on your four corners or wherever you're gonna go. Just tie them up and then when you go to tighten it, They'll keep it. They'll keep it really good, and it won't break off as much. There's another string that you can tie that into, but I mean, it's a great thing. We use um, on most areas if we don't have electric already there. We use a solar charger. Gallagher has everything. If you're looking for it, they've got it. Um, if you're in some areas that aren't flat, say you're going in, it has a little gully or a stream or something. If this bottom wire is touching a lot, it will knock down the uh, shockage on it. So what we do is we have a lot of these uh, insulators. And the best way that I found is put one on the high side on both sides and then just kind of see where you want to put it in the middle. And they're pretty good. You just got to, they've got like a little, if you want to come up and look at it later, but there's like a little notch on it to keep it in there. So if something does try to knock it around, it'll stay in that section. And it's also a good way to, you know, if you want different types of heights and stuff like that, you can run it. Um, best way to do is just pull that forward and then pull it out. And then that's really nice. Um, we have netting. Uh, if you've ever dealt with netting, it's, it's fun, especially if goats get into it. It's, it can really become a mess. Uh, out in Goshen and um, West Six, that's what we used. Uh, it's a great visual barrier and it'll also shock them. Um, we've had some headbutt it and play with it with their horns, which, you know, that, that's always fun. 
I've actually had that around different areas and then ran this on the inside. So this is kind of like the precursor, you'll get hit and I'll keep a distance about like this. So when you come in, you'll know who the, you know, the one that's testing the fence and he can maybe take a trip or something like that. Um, now our waters, we have those over here. I'll kind of show you all that. All our waters at the rotational areas, the hydrants are up top. So we use hedge pipes and all this stuff for irrigation can be bought at KY Irrigation. That's where we get ours. Um, it's really nice. You have a reducer. You put it on, you slip it on to your hedge pipe, get some clamps, clamp it down. And then depending on how long you want it, you can make it as long as you want. I hang mine on the fence so when I mow or weed it, I don't worry about hitting anything. Uh, some T-pipes, some plumbing nipples, and then you can do different stuff if you want two. If you've got a fence, you've got two sides that you want to supply water to, you can grab a T and then two faucets like that. Um, most of ours are on the ball valve and then I just put a direct um, faucet on it and it's worked well. Um, I haven't had it bust off on me yet, so that's really convenient. I haven't came in and the clamps have given up and it's separated. Um, another thing, so if you, if you don't want to get a Gallagher fence, this is kind of an option that I've also done. You can go out and you can buy one of these, which is really convenient, and then you can get a couple of these rolls, and then I've tied it directly to the insulators and ran my, my own personal. So if you're wanting to teach them and you don't want to risk them messing up a, a smart fence, this is a great way to start it off. They can get through it, and like I said, it, it's nothing to just cut it tie back and you're good to go. And once they learn, you can put out the Gallagher fence and they, they already know what they're looking at and they know what's gonna happen if they touch it. Um, so connected to our waters, we use these Highland waters and they're nice. You can um, adjust the ball valve on it. So depending on how high you want it, how low you want it, you can adjust it all. They're pretty durable. Um, one thing that I like about it is so I'll show you how you can put it in, but you can take these apart and there's like a little filter in there to clean out and stuff like that. So the old farm we used to use, we used to use a toilet thing and once rocks and stuff got into it, it ruined it and you'd have to throw it away and replace it. These you can just pull that out, dump it out, screw it back in and you're good to go. So, and you don't even have to disconnect it from the tub to clean it out. You can do it directly inside of it. But all you have to do to get it in is you unscrew the very outside of it. Come to the bottom. It's best to flip them over. I got some things like that. It runs directly into it, and then you just screw it on. And as long as you've got it tight enough, it doesn't. I've not had it leak very much on me. Now, if there's any problem with this, if it's been bent or anything like that, that's caused some issues like that. But other than that, I've had. Uh, good success with them. Now, one thing is, as you can see, there's a string on this one, and then I have that one tied off right there. So once the water level gets to a certain height, it'll raise that ball, and once it gets to the top, it'll cut off. These are nice, but I have had goats play with them. If you can, they've got some extended arms that you can also purchase with these, and I think they come with it, but those are a little bit better. You can screw them on and uh, not have to worry about coming in, and they've knocked the ball off or done something like that and have to go, uh, retie it and waste a whole bunch of water or anything like that. McKinley, uh, I realize they won't pick me up this, on this on the mic, but... I can stand over here for you. You still probably won't pick me up. Oh, okay. One thing about this, that is not the valve that comes with this tank. Mm -mm. These tanks actually come with a ballless toilet valve, okay, that operates on pressure. And what we found is that works good for about a season. Then when we start using them in the second season, it doesn't do as well. And the longer we use them, they start it getting worse and worse. Then you're replacing that valve every year. This is a Ryobi valve that you can order. And we found, I really like this one because of the ease of cleaning up. It also has a better pressure uh, range for doing this than what the toilet valves had. When you're doing a float valve, it's important to watch the pressure rating. There's a lot of times when I've had people talk about using a float valve for livestock and complain about they don't work, they don't work, they don't work. You find out that they're using a valve that's rated to say 40 PSI and they're running a seven, their, their water line's running at 70. So what's happening is the, 
the valve is not designed to get the pressure to shut it off. So this Ryobi valve is designed for a higher pressure. It also has really good flow rate. This is at max a 15 gallon water tank. And we have never, to my knowledge, put enough goats in that if we have the water going to it, that mm -hmm. we've actually had problems with running out of water. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd be a little bit concerned about this valve with cattle and a 15 gallon tank, but I know people using what's called a full flow valve on similar 15, 20 gallon deals like this with cattle doing rotations with them and the cattle not draining it and knocking it over, okay? But it's all about making sure it fills up quick enough. And the other thing I like about this 15 gallon here is when it comes time to need to clean it or move it, it's light enough to cut the water off, flip it mm -hmm. over. You're not fighting a 40 to 60 gallon tank trying to flip over to clean out so that you can get it clean. It's much easier to do that way. And like I said, we've run probably at least 40, 50 goats on one of these before. Easily, yeah. Without having problems with them running it dry. Yeah. Now they can't all drink at one time, but they figure that out and take turns, okay? Yeah. I just wanted to mention the valve because we, I'm pretty sure all of the ones that we have now have this type of valve on them. And so I wanted to make sure you understood if you ordered it, it's not gonna come with that valve. Okay. Now, one thing about these valves is, is when you run a water hose to it, you need to go out and it's an adapter. So these are pipe threaded rather than for a regular water hose. And I can pass this round, but it's FHT to FIP. They're both three fourths of an inch. And you can see in there, if you try to, if you try to put a water hose on it, it will just come right off. But you can go get these adapters screw that right on and your ho water hose will go right on. Now one thing is I would put um, some type of anti-seize or something in there, especially around here. We've had, if you put it on without anything on it and you come back at the end of the season to go take it off, it's pretty much welded together. I mean, the calcium that builds up in it, it's just, you're, you're not gonna get it off very easily. But you can get these at Lowe's. Um, not too bad. I mean, I went out and bought about 10 of them so because they bend pretty easily. So if you ever squeeze it, you got one on hand and you're good to go. Uh, any questions? No? Yes? You appear to be making some form of tape. Is that tape going to be available uh, so that we can get the information that you're providing us now when we don't have the ability to take notes? That, that's Will the, we? Uh, yeah. It's, that's all, the it's all being run on uh, broadcast live on YouTube and Facebook Live. So on the KSU uh, Facebook, uh, KSU Facebook and KSU uh, YouTube? YouTube channel, okay. you'll be able to find. Super. Thank you. So. So another thing that we like to use is, um, so on our fences, we can turn off all fields with this. I can come up to the field, go down to it, test it, figure out how hot it's hitting. If I have any type of fault, it's, you know, it's hitting something, it'll tell me which direction and I can follow it to the fault, fix it, and not have to worry about it. Now on these, it will not shut off. I do not know if they have a newer model of this that will be compatible with this where if you come up to it you can hit it turn that off come back and turn it back on without having to go to it um, uh, McKinley, they, they do make a model of portable panels that does have a remote it's not that it's more like a tv type remote that's just an on off okay yeah and it's a much more limited range that one as long as you touch it to the uh the standoff wire the metal wire i don't know mm -hmm. if, i don't think it'll work with yeah, it won't work with these. But, but as long as you touch it to the metal wire, it transmits back to the unit through that wire. To shut it off. It shuts it off. So anywhere that's in that circuit, we can turn it on and off. And that saves you a lot of time when you find that short that's all the way at the far end. You don't have to run back up, turn it off, run back down, fix it, run back up, turn it back on, run back down, realize it's you didn't get it fixed, yep. run back. Yep. You just turn it on and off right there. It say, like you said, it saves a ton of time. And then, other than that, any more questions? How, how big a, a fencer you have to have on the net to run that efficiently? Mm, I, that'd be a good question for y'all. I like them tall. There's, I, we actually use what was it? Poultry? Was it was it chicken, chicken. or? Yeah. 
poultry, yeah. we've used poultry netting before. It's a lot taller. It's a lot smaller squares. I, it I, I've got some of that. Yeah. I, I, I have trouble. Uh, you're talking about the chargers. How charger, big of a charger yeah. do we need? Oh, about okay. The uh, there's a lot of variation, a lot of differences in, in that. And this charger, actually, if you look at this charger, uh, read Gallagher's information. We use Gallagher equipment because the place that we have a ability to purchase from is a Gallagher supplier, okay? Mm -hmm. The Smart Fence, Gallagher is the only company I know that runs that type of Smart Fence. We've bought net fencing from multiple sources. Yeah. But because that our, our source will sell and service Gallagher chargers, we tend to buy Gallagher chargers, okay? I have ordered other brands of chargers and we've used them as well. I just want to make sure you understand that. Yeah. They'll say that this one really shouldn't be charging as many as we've run off of it before. A lot of it's going to depend on your ground, uh, so your ability to ground the system to have it effective, how much grass weeds you have coming up that okay. cause little shorts all the time. So all of this is going to do that. I have used a system like this with about four sections of that net fencing, uh, the goat sheep net. Would, again, I think you could do the same with the poultry netting, but you, again, I hate the netting because it's almost impossible to keep it from shorting out in a number of places along the way because it sags and you, it touches and all of this stuff. Got a couple of places I want to use eight to ten nets and the one, one fencer just we got any fencers that'll run all eight of them yeah. at the same time. In Goshen, we got close to that many, if not more than that. Mm -hmm. They were using a deep cell battery with a solar charger system. As yeah. long as you have a good battery, it yeah. worked fine. It worked mm -hmm. fine. If the mm -hmm. battery started to get a little bad, then especially at yeah. first thing in the mornings it was yeah. weak and you started having problems with it. So, like I said, if, when we're doing stuff that's going to be like that, I prefer that deep cell battery with the solar, because yeah. you're just not going to have electricity anywhere. Uh, I like using our standoff wire to power temporary fencing where I have it, but like I said, that one's great for a few sections of it, but I wouldn't, mm -hmm. no, that's not going to, no, I, yeah, I, that's not going to hit hard enough to, to stop them. Yeah. And goats do take more power than other species. They're, they're a little bit more stubborn about it. Sheep do, especially wool sheep, because if they're not touching it with their face, their ears, their nose, they're not getting hit because the wool insulates them from it. So you really have to be aware of that and how they're doing it. And it's amazing to see a, a, a goat walk along the edge of that temporary fence and stop and look at it every now and then, graze a little bit more, look at it, and then start grazing away from it if it's on, and jump it if it's off. It's like, how are you, wh what are you smelling, what are you hearing that I can't, that's telling you this is off so it's safe for me to go through it, versus I need to back on away from this. How many bolts will that put on your fence? Hmm. I've had that charger up to six, six and a half joules on the, on the tester. But again, it depends on the type of fence, how good a condition your fence is. Every one of those knots, especially in the morning when it's wet, is... I've been around stuff before and you go and I, I'm hearing it popping and you find a spot where you tied a knot to tie it up and it's, it's popping in that knot because of the dew. So any of that's going to pull that down and that's I think you told them that we we mow a strip to put ours up mm -hmm. and that's just to keep the grass out from that lower strand so it helps us out I finally cut my lower strand and that fixed a lot I just cut it all yeah I mean, as long as your animals aren't wanting to go underneath yeah. uh, and there are some systems out there there are some of these especially some of the net systems Thank you that are a positive negative. And they're set up to where they have a ground that you hook to the ground side of your charger or to a ground rod, and the other is positive. And the problem is with some of these systems we run into with this is as we're running them and it gets drier during the summer, 
we're depending on the electricity because it has to make that circuit. We're depending on the animal completing that circuit through the ground itself, through the earth. And if you have that positive negative on the wire system, then you're not depending on that. If they touch two of those wires, that's completing that circuit to get the pop. Otherwise, you've got to depend on the earth to be able to transmit it back to the system. And that's why it's so important to have a good grounding system, proper grounding system for your charger, and have good, and I've seen people have a charger that's not working, not working, not working, get out there and, and turn a sprinkler on where their ground system is set up at, and all of a sudden it's working again. Mm -hmm. Because what was happening is it got so dry where their ground system was at that it was no longer completing that circuit. But if it's parts dry out on the pasture, you're not getting that connection. You're not getting that circuit complete. Mm -hmm. So again, this is all part of the problem and why you have to test it on a regular basis to make sure it isn't working, is it popping adequately. And on these solar systems, it's so important that that battery be in good shape because it's got to work all night and be able to work long enough in the morning for it to recharge. Mm -hmm. And then if it's a cloudy day, yeah, we do get some solar generation, but not nearly as much as a sunny day. Mm -hmm. And I've seen those things fail like crazy because <laughs> they, somebody using them in the winter and they had a week of cloud cover and it just doesn't hold up. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Green battery the same as a deep cycle battery? Yes, sir. Yeah. They're deep cycle gel batteries. They started out as marine batteries because trolling motors and stuff like that, you didn't have the regeneration on them. Yeah. But like I said, you know, a car battery, any 12 volt battery works in them, but yeah. those work better because they hold their charge they better. Charge better. Yeah. They're designed for, and they're also designed, they're designed to be depleted and then recharged, depleted and recharged, or your regular car battery is designed to kind of stay steady. fairly steady. It, it'll take a little dip, but it's not designed to go up, and down. go up and down that drastic. But they do still wear out. <laughs> Have any other questions? I'm sorry, I wasn't out here when everything started, but uh, I know McKinley's got the two types out there. I prefer the smart fence, the, the polytwine setup, because of ease of handling, it's lighter, but if I've got to have a, if I don't have a perimeter fence, I've got to go with something that's a physical barrier, and that, that's where the net fence comes in. And I know that they're going to be mad at me, Aiden, because I don't have a microphone. So don't worry. <laughs> you can blame it on me, all right? But, uh, the, the reality is you have to think again about where you're putting it up at. The other thing we talked about, browse. How good's a solar system under the trees? You, you know, I, I've seen people complain their solar system wasn't working. You look, it's out there in a the field, but it's facing north <laughs> and northeast. And it's like, okay, most of your sunshine's coming from the southwest. So think about that, and one of the things we have done is because those are designed to set on top of a T-post. In our regular fields, if we're doing it, it's nice to put it on a T-post in your, in your fence line. But if it's not facing the right direction, just get a T-post. You don't have to drive it all the way in there where you can't pull it out easy. Don't drive it past the spade, but put it in there. Put it up there. And uh, I will say this, they come with much longer lines. <laughs> But whenever the goats have access to these leads, they, will they have a tendency to get shorter on you. <laughs> uh, so again, just like anything else, if the fence is off, if your charger wires are there, and especially if you're dealing with goats, they're going to chew on this stuff. So you've got to be aware of it and make sure, like I said, I don't know if those got chewed and shortened or if we realize we need to shorten them. We don't need that long, so we shorten them ourselves to save us the problem. But you need to be aware of that and make sure your stuff is, is designed for that type of situation. The most frustrating time I have ever had in my life with an electric fence was whenever I was growing up at home. 
We had sheep and we had put a low electric fence to keep them from going underneath the woven wire. We did keep it clean. We had one up high so they stopped jumping over it. We had a short, we could not find it, we could not find it, we could not find it. I literally just started walking that whole fence, checking it periodically, periodically till I found where the short was, then backtracked. I am dead serious. A bird's leg was shorting out my fence. <laughs> Apparently a bird had got on that lower fence, died, and all that was left was its leg Still holding on to that lower wire, <laughs> hanging downward, hitting the grass and everything, and it was shorting it out. Had a similar situation here. Couldn't find the short, couldn't find the short. Found out that somebody had connected one of these types of systems with a piece of polytwine. And when they disconnected it, they just they didn't t untie it all the way from the standoff wire. And every time I had driven by there before, didn't see a problem, but caught it just right one day. If it was turned just right, it was touching the woven wire. So again, you've got to watch this. And that's where that short finder is so help helpful. If it's a dead short, it will tell you it's in this direction, it's in this direction, it's in this direction. So you can use that to narrow down and to trace to it. And like I said, with that, because it's also a remote, oh, here it is. I can turn the system off from here. When I was a kid, we used jump wires for that. It was always that first little. <laughs> because is it shorting out dead enough to where it's not coming through? Or am I going to get shocked as soon as I go to grab this to fix the problem? And then you're careful yanking those off again for the same reason. That I turn the system off and I turn it back on. It cost a little more, but it's worth it. <laughs> and I will be honest, that system, I didn't buy the full package because we're a university. I wanted to save some money. If I were doing that same system on my own personal property and had a lot of electric fence, there is another component I could buy to hook to that, and it would literally text me if there was a dead short. But you got to have a sales service, sell all this. And I'm sitting there, it's like, okay, who would we have that sent to here? What would be the issues, all of that stuff? Ours is a metal barn. Would we get good enough sales service in the metal barn? What's, is it, you know, the university's not going to want to pay for a sales service for the fence charger, even if it's not going to text very often. But you can see, again, this is some of the advances they're making in the chargers as we go on. And like I said, I've seen several brands of the portable chargers that come with a remote, but like I said, it's a, like a TV remote where you can go off and that, and here's my thing about that. If I'm going to set this up for like a browsing thing, what's my biggest piece of equipment in all of this? My most expensive, the fence in that charger. So if somebody's going to come steal something, now, if I could put that charger inside the electric fence and turn it on and off from the outside <laughs> of that electric fence, that helps me secure that piece of equipment from somebody coming by. It also, by doing that, keeps somebody from going through, turning my charger off, and my animals getting out or getting tangled up in the fence. We're not doing a lot of that, so I haven't invested in that type of a system before, but I looked at it at one time as a possibility of that, so I just wanted to make sure y'all knew that. That's not the only type of remote. There are some actual remotes that they use for some other types of charges. But like I said, it's like a TV remote. It's either a radio frequency or I think it uses radio frequency to turn it on and off. Okay? All right. Any other questions or something else that can bring me on a tangent? <laughs> uh, if not, we greatly appreciate everybody being here. Unless, right. Kelly, you got anything else to add? I think we've covered it all. Okay, the, the systems are good. Like I said, there is a fencing school on the 11th of November that we're hosting here. Uh, if you're on my list or on our email list, you should have got a notice about it. Uh,
Kentucky Forge and Grassland Council is the host. If you go to their website, you should be able to sign up for it. No, it's not free. It's not something we're doing. We're just hosting it. And they go over, I've had McKinley go through it. They talk a lot about it. I think, I don't remember, if, a, a, Emily, I don't remember if you've actually been, I know you've been to the grazing one. I, did grazing. I don't know if you've been to the fencing one, but they do, do a really good job of teaching how to put up a fence. They do classroom and then they actually physically go out and put up a section of fence. Um, our biggest problem on this farm is they want to do not just woven wire, they want to do a bob wire fence as well and some other types of fences. And we typically just use woven wire on our farm here. So we're gonna, we're working with them, we'll get it all done. But So it's not just a classroom, it is gonna be a hands-on, you will be out in the field helping put up a fence, okay? They have a contractor come in, they get the posts lined out, but you learn how to put up a fence. So it's not just classroom, you get to physically see how all of this stuff is done. And if you've ever built fence, you'll probably realize there are a number of tricks and cuts and things like this that you can do to do it better and to do it easier and still make sure it is correct. And a fence put up wrong is a problem. A fence put up right will last, okay? So I just wanted to remind you of that. And at some point, we intend to host a grazing school here as well that'll focus more on small ruminants. But again, we had all this stuff scheduled before COVID hit. Because of COVID, as y'all know, we're just now about June, Ju July of this year is when we were allowed to start having in-person meetings back at this facility. So we're trying to get everything rescheduled back with the people uh, that do these programs so that we can host some of them. And like I said, we do send it out. I usually send it to my email list and I send it to Shelly and ask her to send it to our third Thursday, our beef cattle and, and those lists as well. So if you're on my list and her list, you may get it twice. But my goal is to make sure you at least get it once, okay? Thank you. Okay. <laughs>